dinner together. So I'm going to be eating. Wonderful. Okay, everyone. Um, we have started recording the meeting. Welcome to the Open Space Board of Trustees meeting of July 14th, 2021. Um, as usual, we will start by uh, calling the roll. Um, do we have Karen Holwig? Here. Do we have Dave Kuntz? Here. Do we have Caroline Miller? Present. Michelle Estrella is not going to be present for this meeting. And uh, I, Hal Holsteinman, am here. So we have four out of five board members this evening. Um, wonderful. To begin, um, I'd like to hand the meeting off to Allison to give an overview of the City of Boulder's uh, rules and guidelines for boards and commission meetings. Okay, so thank you for joining this evening and in order to have um, transparent online engagement and security, the following rules will be applied to this meeting. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the City of Boulder, so activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited and no person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using the person's real name and we need a full, a full first and last name. So if you've joined the meeting on something that looks like Tom's iPad, we would ask that you add a last name to that before we are able to unmute you. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees and invited speakers and presenters, all others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. The chat function is enabled to myself only, so that's only for Zoom related technical questions, not content questions. And only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. When we get to public comment and the public hearing uh, later on this evening, you can raise your hand if you wish to sign up to speak. And you can do that by clicking on your participants icon, probably at the bottom of your screen. And that will open a box where you can click these three little dots and click on the raise hand feature. Or some people are able to find it in their um, little emojis icon also at the bottom of the screen and they can raise their hand from there too. If you have joined us by phone this evening and you wish to raise your hand, you can do that by pressing star nine. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Allison. Um, with that, as we always start out our meetings, um, we will begin by reviewing the minutes from our prior meeting. Um, and so I'll ask people to look to uh, page one of the prior meeting minutes dated June 9th, 2021. Um, why don't we go page by page? Does anyone see any problems on the first page? Nope. S seeing none, let's proceed to page two. Does anyone have any problems or issues on the second page? Great. Seeing none, we'll proceed to uh, the third page, which is largely a list of people speaking in, in public comment. Dave. Uh, Leah, I have a, a real minor consistency suggestion. And Kathy Joyner, it says, spoke in favor of the draft disposal, whereas all the others were either against disposal. or, or um, And so I think it just should read in favor of the disposal. No problem with that there. Sounds good. And um, page four. Karen, uh, Dave? Uh, Hal, I, I had another uh, real uh, kind of grammatical one. Uh, Leah, on the uh, fifth whereas on page four, 
which is whereas after lengthy studies and investigations, I, I think we have has been determined twice in that uh, sentence. So um, I'm suggesting like the fourth line down about midway through the sentence, which where the words has been determined, uh, you delete those because above in the second sentence, it says the city has determined, so we don't need to have two determines, I don't think. The city has determined that a flood wall to be built. Um, so I know this is so, such a, a, a minor thing, and I think Dave, you'd recognize that the worst but is that a, uh, a minutes change or a change to the approved document yeah. you want to go back and now edit? And I realize yeah. it's all semantic, but I also want to be consistent on how we treat the review of the minutes. Yeah, that's I, a good good question. Uh, I think though, though it's redundant, I, I agree it's redundant, but I think it's clear to read the way it is. And, and frankly, I don't feel like it rises to a level of importance where we'd want to open the language of the resolution. Yeah. That's fine with me. Okay. Uh, um, we did have uh, some, yeah, go ahead, Karen. Um, if Michelle were here, I would ask her to add a phrase explaining her dissent. Um, for those of you who were not part of the city briefing for board chairs and co-chairs, and I know several of you participated in that, the city has asked wherever there's a dissenting vote for there to be an explanation of the dissent, the nature of the dissent. Um, so maybe this is as much a note for Leah, since Michelle is not here. Um, when that happens to be sure to ask for the reason for the descending vote so that we can comply with city format. And I don't wanna to pretend to get inside Michelle's head and try to construct a reason for her in her absence. So I think we've just gotta leave it in an old fashioned blank at this point with an unknown, but in the future, if, if Leah, if you could try to make sure that we get that information at the time that that would satisfy me. Yeah, I, you know, I um, aligned uh, with Michelle on a number of points there, and I do think I understand, but also agree it wouldn't be appropriate for me to attempt to encapsulate that. So I think you're right. We need to approve it as it's written and make that a goal um, for future minutes. Yeah. Um, it's just unfortunate we don't have her here this evening to, for the record. And I tried to email her and get that information from her, but was unsuccessful in doing that over the last few days. Okay. Yeah, she's out of town with her family, so. Okay, so we will um, let that continue uh, as written on page four. Um, page five is largely additional uh, language from the resolution itself, same as six seven, eight, Excuse me. nine, and frankly, nine has nothing other than the adjournment on it. However, I, I think it's really important since this is a public document to include the two maps at the end of the resolution since they were part of the board's consideration and part of the resolution. So I would ask that Leah paste in uh, what are they called, Exhibit A and Exhibit B that are referred to in the document, but were not attached. A very good catch. I think we should do that as well. Leah, John Potter could assist you with that if, if you don't have a quick pulse of where it's at because he was made aware of that. Perfect, yeah, thanks. I think I have it, but we'll make sure they're included. Thank you. Great. So um, would anyone like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the prior meeting? I so move. I've got a motion from Dave. I will second the motion and we will call the roll. Karen Hallway. Yes. Dave Kuntz. Yes.
Caroline Miller. Yes. And I also uh, approve. So we are closed on the meetings, uh, the prior meetings minutes. Um, next up, we are going to move into our public comment period. This public comment period is meant for items not identified for public hearing on our agenda. Um, in this case, that refers to uh, the acquisition of a public trail easement um, related to the uh, North Sky Trail. And so we uh, ask you if your comments are in that area to please wait until the portion of the meeting where we'll have a dedicated public comment for that. But now will be a good time to uh, open the floor for generalized public comments. So I'll hand it over to you, Allison. Thanks, Hal. No one from the public is here tonight. We did have somebody sign up in advance, and I don't see that name in the participants box. And I. Okay. Well, let's give it just a, a last call. Anybody out there who yeah, would like to comment, they can raise their hand at this time. Maybe they haven't been able to find the link for the meeting. It's a little surprising to have no one. Although um, I believe I access this through the, the public website link. Uh, there's one person in the waiting room. Let's... Yeah, that's Frances. Okay, w was she the one who was signed up? No, no, she's an employee. Okay. Um, okay, with, with no uh, public comment desired, we will both open and close the public comment period. And with that, um, Dan, I'd like to turn it over to you. So you may have noticed a, a slight tweaking to normal agenda templates in, in which we put the matters from the department up front in this meeting with the public hearing item uh, below it to accommodate uh, last meeting. Uh, uh, as, as, as we all know, we went over and uh, uh, staff was unable to present um, the uh, uh, overview of the management response to prevent further spread of New Zealand mud snails. So, as an appeasement and an apology, we promised that group could go up front tonight. Um, so with that, we're looking forward to this long overdue presentation and uh, I'll introduce uh, staff ecologist, Adam Gaylord, who will lead us through this presentation. Nice, thanks, Dan. Uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, happy to be here to tell you about what we've been doing with uh, New Zealand mud snail management on OSMP. I think Leah's gonna bring up the presentation. There we go. Nice. Thank you very much. Um, most of what I'm about to present was included in the written update uh, that you received last month, actually, and it was included in this month's board packet again. Um, so I'll move through it pretty quickly so we can get to any questions you might have. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. I'll jump right in with some basic mud snail ecology. Uh, New Zealand mud snails are invasive aquatic snails uh, native to New Zealand, as you might imagine. They're tiny. The adults max out at six to seven millimeters, uh, and immature snails are even smaller than that. Uh, think the size of a sand grain. Um, they're nocturnal grazers, so they scrape organic detritus and algae off of submerged rocks and logs. Um, they reproduce exclusively via parthenogenesis, which is a self-cloning. It's pretty amazing. Uh, every mud snail in the Western US is a clone of a single uh, female mud snail. Um, and each snail is born with 20 to 120 embryos already developing in her reproductive system, which means they can multiply, multiply really quickly. Uh, in fact, uh, in ideal conditions, a single female can result in a colony of 40 million snails in one year. So they're pretty amazing little creatures, actually. Uh, another cool thing they have is a, a they have a retractable operculum, uh, which you, is a little bit of shell uh, that highlighted by the red arrow in the photo that the snail can pull over the opening in the main shell, kind of like a trap door. Um, it makes them much less vulnerable to desiccation, to drying out. Um, and as such, they can survive out of water for several days, especially in a wet medium like uh, damp waders or that sort of thing. 
uh, they can also tolerate a pretty wide a range of environmental conditions, uh, such as temperature and pH, uh, salinity, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, another thing they do is form super dense colonies. In some places like hot spring fed streams in Yellowstone, the densities will get up uh, around 800,000 snails per square meter, which is pretty incredible. Um, here on the front range, we see densities top out at around 300,000 snails per square meter, which is still a lot, uh, as you can see in this photo of a rock taken uh, in Dry Creek near the Dry Creek trailhead. Um, still just completely coat the underside of the rock. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, actually, last slide, please. I, I, I jumped the gun a little bit there. So uh, the, the thing about those super dense colonies is they, they can displace native invertebrates, uh, such as mayflies or cassid flies, uh, which are the species that fish rely on for food. Um, and that might make you wonder, if the fish can just eat the mud snails? Uh, the, the answer is yes, but it's a little more complicated. Uh, studies have shown that when native fish such as rainbow trout each eat the New Zealand mud snails, uh, that because of that operculum we talked about, that uh, approximately 90% of the snails pass through the trout undigested. And of those, more than half of them are alive. So what you get is smaller fish in poor condition because their normal diet has been displaced. Uh, and then what they're eating, the snails, uh, don't supply the calories the fish expend actually foraging for the snails. Um, so, so obviously pretty rough thing for the fish. Now the next slide, please. Uh, and while there's a chance that fish help spread undigested snails in their bellies, um, humans actually appear to be the primary vector of spread. Uh, the tiny snails can stick to things like boats or floaties. Um, they can be introduced via ship ballast or attached uh, to the holes of boats. That seems to be, uh, th those mechanisms seem to be the, how they've spread in the Great Lakes. Um, but here in the Mountain West, the primary uh, source of spread seems to be wading, uh, which is most likely anglers. Um, now, I want to take a second to acknowledge the angling community is an important conservation partner. They've been really supportive of our New Zealand mud snail efforts, so I don't want to throw them under the bus at all. Um, it's even worth noting that the two locations that were recently discovered on South Boulder Creek, that uh, the, the new infestations, uh, appear to be more regularly visited by like families and dogs than anglers. So. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, regardless of what specific user group is in the creek at any given moment or location, the key takeaway is that every visitor that accesses the creek represents a potential spread, uh, a vector to spread the New Zealand mud snail. Um, another key point is that New Zealand mud snails float downstream. And you know that's simple enough, but it's important in terms of how we manage. It means that protecting upstream reaches is key given that the introduction there will infest everything downstream because they float. Um, it's also important for management uh, it, to know that there um, currently isn't any way to control New Zealand mud snails once they've been introduced. In their native range in New Zealand, they're kept in check by parasitic trematodes. Um, as I understand it, those trematodes would keep them in check here, but unfortunately they're not species specific. Uh, so they would also uh, attack our native snails, which would be bad, which is which is why they haven't been approved for release. Um, there are some really nasty chemical treatments that can be used if they infest, uh, like water treatment facilities, or, or if there's like a septic pond, you can dry it out for a year or two uh, in order to to make sure the mud dries out enough that all the snails die. Um, but obviously neither of those options are viable for a natural stream. Um, so so no, no viable way to get them out of our waterways once they are in. Next Adam, slide, what, Adam uh, if I could just jump in, wh what is a trematode? Oh yeah, sorry, that's a small parasitic worm. Uh, we, we don't want those, uh, you, you don't want anything to do with them, but that's what, that's what they are. <laughs> are they about the same size as the mud snail? I think even a little smaller. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. So yeah, next slide, please. So let's talk about where the mud snails are. Uh, they were first discovered in the US in Idaho's Snake River in 1987. 
Uh, they now, now occupy streams and ponds across 23 states in the Western US and the Great Lakes regions, uh, which you can see here in brown. Next slide. Here in Colorado, uh, the first discovery of New Zealand mud snail was unfortunately right here in Boulder, in Boulder Creek in 2004. Over time, the snails have spread. This map shows where we currently have New Zealand mud snails on OSMP and when they were first detected uh, in each of the infested reaches. Uh, the first detections are in dark green and the most recent detections are in red. Um, we've detected the New Zealand mud snails in Boulder Creek, downstream of 28th Street, uh, parts of Four Mile Canyon Creek, Dry Creek, and then most recently in Wonderland Lake, or excuse me, Wonderland Creek, not Wonderland Lake, Wonderland Creek and South Boulder Creek. Uh, and that was in August of 2020. Next slide, please. Uh, those of you who were here at that time will remember that we, uh, soon after we discovered the snails in South Boulder Creek, uh, the department pulled together an inter interdisciplinary team representing work groups from across uh, OSMP. Uh, you can see those groups listed here. Since then, we've uh, the team has met on a weekly basis uh, to review and recommend changes to New Zealand mud snail management with the goal of protecting aquatic resources while considering other charter purposes, including passive recreation. Next slide, please. Uh, the team recognized a need to move quickly to try to protect South Boulder Creek, uh, which is one of the most ecologically intact streams in the Front Range. Um, and as such, in October of 2020, the team recommended and then in, enacted uh, a suite of interim management actions to protect South Boulder Creek, um, including uh, an emergency closure of access of South Boulder Creek between South Boulder Road and Marshall Road, uh, including targeted enforcement by OSMP Rangers, uh, we instituted a comprehensive educational campaign, including educational signs and, uh, and outreach, uh, on-site outreach with staff. Um, we also did some other kinds of outreach, including a press release, uh, updates to our website, and educational mailers sent to landowners adjacent to South Boulder Creek. Um, we also did education materials distributed to local angling groups uh, and coordination with some of our commercial use permittees. Um, all of that was detailed in a written update to uh, OSBT in November of 2020, if you want to go back and reference that. Next slide, please. Uh, at that point, the team then moved on to considering long-term system-wide New Zealand mud snail, snail management. <laughs> mud snail, snail. You say it too many times and it gets a little trippy on the tongue. Um, so based on the background I've presented and quite a a bit more than I haven't, the team developed a set of management premises. Um, and those are that OSMP should seek to protect, pr protect uninfested, high quality reaches from New Zealand mud snail infestation. Uh, preventing introduction of upstream reaches is crucial to preventing infestation of downstream reaches. Infesting reaches with low New Zealand mud snail infested reaches with low New Zealand mud snail density may pose a lower probability of being a source for spread and that high visitation increases the risk of spread. Those were kind of the management premises uh, that we move or that we built upon. Um, next slide, please. So building upon those premises, the team developed a management framework for individual stream reaches based upon the ecological quality of the individual stream reach, uh, whether that reach was un infested with New Zealand mud snails, if it is, the relative density of snails in that reach, and then the amount and type of visitor use in and around that reach. Next slide, please. And then using that framework, the team developed the following general management recommendation, which is uh, to close access to certain high quality uninfested stream reaches to prevent infestation of New Zealand mud snails, uh, and then to close some reaches with particularly high density of New Zealand mud snails that pose a significant risk, uh, risk as a source of spread. Next slide. So this map is a little busy, but I'll talk you through it. Uh, it's the same map that is in the written update, so you can reference it there as well. Uh, 
uh, streams are in blue, perennial streams are in blue. You can see Four Mile Canyon Creek in the upper left and South Boulder Creek extending down into the lower right. Um, the stream reaches in red are currently infested by New Zealand mud snails, but we are not planning any change in management. So we'll be sticking with existing management of those red reaches. Uh, for example, the portions of Boulder Creek in the upper right are located in parcels that are already closed to the public, uh, which is that yellow thatch there. Um, so they'll remain closed, so no change in management. The orange, uh, little bits of orange, there's not much of them, but you can you can see them near Arapaho Road there. Uh, the orange stream reaches are, those will be closing because they have particularly high density of New Zealand mud snails and uh, therefore pose a relatively high risk as a source of spread. And then the purple portions are the areas we'll be closing access to because they are particularly high quality and currently don't have snails. Um, so obviously it would be great to keep them from becoming infested. So altogether to the new uh, closures, uh, affect approximately 6.2 miles of stream and are composed of portions of South Boulder Creek, Four Mile Canyon Creek, and Dry Creek. Next slide, please. Uh, along with the closures, OSMP will uh, conduct extensive education outreach uh, to visitors and land owners and stakeholder groups. Uh, we'll be implementing targeted enforcement efforts um, and we'll continue and implement new visitor use and ecological monitoring to inform uh, OSMP's management over time uh, so we can adjust as new information comes in. Um, we'll be exploring opportunities for ecological restoration afforded by the closures, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. And uh, we'll continue to explore water access on a system-wide basis, um, including where it's appropriate and what infrastructure is needed to support those uses. For example, along South Boulder Creek uh, in the Bottle Link area, where we decided that, to keep creek access and have designated access points, um, just as an example. So most of these uh, will start, most of these efforts will start right away. Uh, and the closures will be uh, phased over the next few years. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2021, the main emphasis will be on closing access to South Boulder Creek at South Mesa Trailhead. Uh, as I mentioned before, South Boulder Creek is one of the most ecologically intact streams uh, on the entire Front Range. Uh, its invertebrate community is considered a reference community for the state of Colorado because of its high species diversity and richness uh, among several other metrics, uh, all of which could be negatively impacted by New Zealand mud snails. Um, and you know, you can think of South Mesa Trailhead as being kind of a line in the sand for South Boulder Creek in that it's a, in one of the most upstream sections on OSMP. So if New Zealand mud snails are introduced there uh, because they float downstream, uh, then one of the most important aquatic resources on the Front Range will be irreversibly impacted. So we'll, we'll be implementing a regulatory closure of access to the stream and supporting those closures with additional fencing. Uh, as well as targeted education and outreach and enforcement. Um, next slide, please. So this closure will also afford us the opportunity to implement significant ecological restoration, uh, such as removing non-native crack willow. Uh, uh, the photo on the left is a large crack willow next to the bridge north of the trailhead. Uh, and then the photo on the right is the same spot after crack willow was removed just yesterday, actually. Uh, and you can see it really opened up the area because uh, crack willow tend to grow so dense that they exclude uh, the good native shrubs. Um, so, uh, so clearing out those non-native crack willow will really open things up. And after we get the fencing in, we'll go in and uh, seed with native species, appropriate native species, and we'll be planting a bunch of native shrubs. Um, we've also already done some treatment for, for uh, non-native species, including uh, or, or non-native herbaceous species, including tall oak grass. Uh, we did a treatment this spring, which was actually quite successful in taking out some of uh, or a, good, a good portion of the tall oak grass uh, right along the creek, which is really exciting. Um, and we're hoping to continue our, our herbaceous weed treatment over the next few years, and then follow that up with even more seeding and more planting. Um, and so all of that will, uh, will improve habitat for, um, you know, 
designated critical habitat for Preble's Meadow, Meadow Jumping Mouse, which is important. Um, it's also hopeful that with the fencing and closure and seating and everything else that we will be able to close and restore up to a thousand feet of undesignated trails uh, along that corridor. Um, so some real ecological benefit uh, that it's just kind of icing on the cake to the New Zealand mud snail side of things. Next slide, please. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for your time uh, and allowing me the opportunity to update you on what we've been up to with New Zealand mud snails and how we're trying to protect our streams. Um, happy to try to answer any questions you may have at this time. So yeah, please let me know what questions you have. Adam, thank you so much for returning um, this month for us. Uh, your time on this uh, project is greatly appreciated. D does anyone have clarifying questions? I see Caroline there and you're on mute. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Um, and uh, sorry um, for waiting so long at our last meeting um, and ending like that. So thank you for being back. Um, you were saying that if these uh, mud smells were um, found in South Boulder Creek, it would be irreversible um, damage to the ecosystem. Have, have there been any studies done in the US where they have been able to successfully eradicate them out of a specific area? The only things I'm aware of are the things that I mentioned, like water treatment facilities. There was actually a fish, fish hatchery here in Boulder that was infested. Um, actually, a it was concurrent with the discovery in Boulder Creek in 2004, uh, and that that getting them out of that facility, I, 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 I'm speaking a little out of my realm, but I seem to remember it involved some pretty nasty chemicals. Uh, uh, but um, you know, in terms of natural systems, uh, not anything that I'm aware of. Um, that having been said, there is ongoing research into you know I mentioned the trematodes and how that they keep them in check in their native range and that they are not species specific. So they have not yet been approved for release here, but there is ongoing research uh, th that uh, has been conducted by the USDA and others to hopefully find some sort of pathogen or something, or even modify the existing pathogens in some way that at some point they could be introduced to uh, eradicate or at least keep snail populations in check. So there, there is hope that down the line research will uh, will help us in that regard. And do they survive um, only in moving water like rivers and streams or are they found in ponds um, and are able to, to continually reproduce in that environment? They, they are sometimes found in ponds. It's mostly creeks and I, I think it has to do a little bit with water quality as, uh, as far as that goes. But uh, yeah, they can, they can survive a lot of places. They're, uh, they're pretty hardy little buggers. <laughs> Yeah, the, um, the reproduction rate, I think you said in one year, 40 million, is that what? Yeah, you know, once you account for the 120 that are already in the reproductive track of the single snail, and then once they're born, the 120 that are already in the track of every one of those, then over the course of a single year, you, you know, ideal conditions, you could end up with a colony of uh, up to a 40 million, which is pretty incredible. And, and sorry, I, I said one, I think I'm on four. Um, how do we determine that they right now are not in certain areas? I mean, I understand sampling, but since they are so tiny and um, it seems like could be easily missed if they were starting to colonize somewhere, how do we do that? Well, keeping in mind that you can, you know, you can never prove absence. That's always uh, part of the deal. But um, we we do pretty extensive monitoring, uh, and we try to maximize the likelihood that we'll find snails by conducting that monitoring in August. Um, every year, the snail populations are in the different streams across the system and across the state and country are knocked back by cold spells during the winter. They're they're uh, rarely, if ever, uh, eradicated from any given spot, but the, the numbers are at least decreased over the course of the winter by, by the cold, uh, cold water. And then during the course of the spring and summer, those densities increase um, so that you get the highest densities generally late uh, July through the end of August. Um, so we try to maximize the likelihood that we'll find snails by conducting our surveys at that time. Uh, and and we're, we've, we've had some pretty 
pretty robust monitoring over the years, and we're trying to ramp that up even further to better inform. And, and uh, uh, up until this point, it's been largely presence absence surveys, uh, some density monitoring as well, but we're going to try to do some more density monitoring to understand those changes and also how those the densities vary given different types of habitat, even within a single stream, but definitely across streams as well. So uh, ongoing monitoring and research we're hoping to better understand. Thank you. Um, on that topic, actually, of uh, water temperature, I was curious what we know about water temperature, New Zealand mud snails, and what um, discussions may or may not be having, uh, being had with sort of Denver water, other people who control stream flow, and, and sort of help us paint the picture there on water temperature. Sure. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're quite hardy and they are they can survive in a pretty wide range of temperatures um, you know up into the way too warm for our native fish to survive and all the way down to freezing so zero degrees Celsius um, mm. uh, at at the freezing point this the snail populations are knocked back considerably that having been said as I mentioned before the the it's unlikely that without an extremely cold and prolonged cold that it would kill all the snails in any given spot because what the snails will do is, is uh, burrow up under roots in the bank or uh, burrow down in the mud under the rocks and they'll find refuge uh, that's just warm enough that a few of them will survive. And as I've said, it only takes a few to then reestablish the following year. Um, so that that's that'll give you an idea of kind of their temperature regime that they're, they're able to survive, which is pretty wide for a small invertebrate like that. Um, as far as, you know, outside coordination, we're, we've been in talks with uh, a lot of our neighbors. We've been uh, talking with Boulder County. We've been uh, talking with uh, other departments in the city, utilities, greenways, um, uh, parks and rec about how to uh, better unify management for the snails and what we can do to uh, w within the city to make sure we're following our own recommendations and, and doing everything we can to keep snails from spreading. Um, we've also been uh, in contact quite a bit with CPW and uh, to, to make sure we're aware of, that they're aware of our situation, that we're aware of how they manage and, and what their recommendations are. Um, I, I don't believe that we've been in contact with Denver Water. Um, I don't, I don't, know how <laughs> you know I, I, they the snails don't do particularly good in like white water sort of habitats where the water the water velocity is so high that they have a hard time holding on to the rocks but given that they can survive such temperature requirements and that you have to get up into like a white water category uh, of stream velocity to kind of exclude them. I don't know how any sort of stream release by Denver water could help us uh, that, that much. I, I'm, I'm not particularly hopeful on that end. Okay, so, so the, the good fortune we have of not seeing infestations higher up in the system may not be about temperature, it's more about velocity, but those areas are at risk, you know, or, or certainly areas where the water is slacker. C certainly, yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And just, just to follow up, one small follow-up to, to Hal's questions. Um, in, in our CIP materials for this meeting, there's mention of South Boulder Creek in street, in street, uh, in stream flow, funding. Does that have any relationship to this work at all or not? You implied um, that it didn't. But. Dan or or uh, does somebody else have an answer to that? I, I, I'm not aware of that CIP request. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I can address that, Karen. Uh, that CIP project relates to the, uh, the agreement that we have with Denver Water, Lafayette, and Louisville to uh, be monitoring uh, flows related to the environmental pool and gross reservoir. It has nothing to do with the New Zealand mud snail project. Okay, and it won't have any impact on the snail population in terms of flow or anything like that. Nope. Okay. Thank you. Dave. You're on, You're on mute, Dave. Dave. 
Thank you. <laughs> I, I have a couple questions. Um, so are we are we working with uh, El Dorado Canyon State Park staff uh, as far as those upper reaches of South Boulder Creek? Are, are we cooperating with them in any way? We are, yeah. We've been in touch with uh, El Dorado Canyon uh, State Park staff. Uh, we're, we're talking about how we can uh, work together on outreach and messaging, uh, maybe some educational materials, um, uh, that that side of things so, so that that is ongoing coordination that that is occurring great and i have a couple more quick ones um you know i'm a little interested in uh, four mile canyon creek which uh is dry much of the year so how are the snails surviving Do you, are they like in pools or in muddy areas or you know kind of like that that's the that's the concern is that there are enough deep water pools uh, and you're sound like you're pretty familiar with that str uh, that stream and I'm sure you know the the sorts of pools we're talking about uh, but there are enough pools that have have water in them and do not freeze completely during the winter uh, that the the snails could be viable uh, th throughout the year. Okay, so my last question is more programmatic. So overall how how much staff time and what's what's the cost of uh, all the endeavors uh, do we have that information as far as kind of what the management uh, costs are dealing with the mud snail uh, I, I don't have that handy right at the moment. We do have, I've got spreadsheets galore and I can, I can put together, uh, I'm a spreadsheet kind of guy, I got to tell you, but I can, I can put together some summary figures for you if that's of, of interest. Well, I just think in the public forum, it's uh, useful for the public to know, you know, kind of what the cost, both staff time for monitoring and, and uh, management efforts and also the costs, you know, for programs like this. So that could be part of our educational effort is to get some of that information, you know, out on the ground to uh, the visitors. Gotcha. Okay. Good point. Caroline. Thanks. <laughs> I'm kind of following up um, with what you guys were saying with them being able to um, bury down to, to get to that water um, in four miles. Has, has there been any determination of how long they can live without a food source like obviously streams um, and rivers are ideal for them but um if they were buried because the the river had dried up how how long can they, can they hold out or no one really knows i mean i don't know but i mean individual uh, an individual snail is going to have a very small uh caloric and nutrient requirement to it so if you if you consider the the amount of just ambient uh, uh dead stuff <laughs> in, in a stream the, the the detritus and and algae and and other like bits of plants and everything else that are are just inherent in any stream you know i think it's very unlikely that uh a snail or a few snails or a few dozen snails would run out of food uh i think that the it would be much more likely uh, that we'd run into mortality from desiccation or freezing or that sort of thing before it was running out of food. I, uh, I think they do just fine on that end. That makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Um, I have a few questions starting on page five of the document um, where you mentioned Dry Creek and the closure and fencing the work that's been done there. Um, was that effective in keeping the dogs out of South Boulder Creek? And did that do anything? I mean, as an experience in trying to uh, exert some management control, uh, was that successful? And in to what degree? And what? Uh, how, how effective was it? 
we did have some awfully good success at Dry Creek in terms of excluding both people and dogs. Um, I was out there recently and looked over, actually I've been out there several times recently to look over the fencing and um, look for any sort of use on the other side of the fencing. Uh, you know, the summer is a great time to to look for that sort of use given the, the grass, uh, it's easy to track where people have or haven't gone or dogs have and haven't gone. Um, and we're seeing very little, very low use in the closure area, if, if any at all. Um, <clears throat> so, so we have had, had good luck at Dry Creek and are hoping to use kind of the things we learned in terms of uh, fencing there. Um, it's, it should be noted that it's not a, uh, it's not entirely apples to oranges, Dry Creek to South Mesa Trailhead. Um, there are some differences in uh, how people use those spaces and historical use over time, but 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 we're hoping that we can the, the lessons we learned at Dry Creek can be applied and that we'll have some good good success there. Great, thank you. And then the the uh, diagram just below that paragraph on page five shows red dots. Um, it looks like along Bobolink and uh, and then south of Bobolink before you get to South Boulder Road. Um, and from my experience out there, um, it looks to me like those might be dog access points. And I didn't, um, I didn't make note in your presentation that, that you identified dogs as a source of spread or a concern. Are they? Given the dog experience at Dry Creek, that's my inference, but I just need to ask that. Sure. Um, so you know, a couple things there. It's worth noting that the those those red points in the diagram, figure two, mm -hmm. uh, which are the locations for where we've recently found New Zealand mud snails in South Boulder Creek, north of South Boulder Road, uh, there there are accessed by dogs. They're also accessed by kids and families and and all sorts of things. So we can't port uh, can't point to uh, any one species or or, or group mm -hmm. as a as the one that definitely introduced snails there. So I uh, just, just want to say that, but uh, dogs are a, a potential source of spread. The, the snails can um, stick between the pads on a dog's foot or even within the fur uh, on a, especially the particularly hairy breeds, of course, uh, furry breeds. Um, and, you know, especially if a, a, a guardian, a dog guardian takes a dog into multiple bodies of water in a single day, there's there's a risk there. But even even over the course of a couple of days, because of uh, how hardy the snails are and how long they can survive uh, outside of water, there's potential that you know, if you went one day to one and the next day to another, that there could mm -hmm. be spread there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then um, the next to the last slide that you showed, mm -hmm. um, if I'm orienting myself right in that picture. Behind the crack willow on the far side of the slide, um, I believe is where that private landowner has a set of steps down to the creek. Um, and you've, you've mentioned that you've sent postcards to landowners. I'm wondering along this reach of South Boulder Creek, um, what your concerns are and then plans for addressing concerns with the private landowners that have ready access to the creek 24 7. Certainly um, you know there is risk uh, risk of introduction by those landowners uh, obviously it's private property and they they are mm -hmm. they can do what they want obviously but um, you know we are trying to reach out to landowners by the mailers and by uh, press releases um, and and you know for, through conversations as well to uh, try to to, to, to educate, to talk, you know, inform about the snails and what the potential risks are and, and ask that, uh, that they are partners in this effort with us. Um, and yeah, that's, that'll be an ongoing effort. It almost seems like it's worth a community meeting or a dedicated staff person to go up and down the creek talking with people directly because of the, I mean, 
our efforts as as well thought out uh, as the concept and the plan is in the document that we received. And again, I want to join my colleagues in apologizing to you for bumping you off the agenda last time. Um, but it seems to me, given all the time and as D Dave pointed out, expense of trying to address this on our property, it's also um, worth the initiative to, to really address these people in person and make it clear to them what their partnership activities are in, in preventing the infestation uh, from their private properties. I think that's an excellent point, and I think uh, you know it's it's something that we can thankfully continue to work on and work with those landowners, and and yeah, we will continue to explore that absolutely. It's a it's a huge lift, and as you said, we have no control. But <laughs> yep. And if I can just jump in, this is Megan, Karen, and um, we we definitely have had outreach with with that community, and we will continue to do so. And so I totally hear what you're saying, especially that location um, that Adam showed in the presentation. So yeah, we we definitely want to work with as many people as possible to make this be as successful as possible. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and then another quick question on figure five, um, the map there that shows the South uh, Mesa trailhead and the fencing plan. Mm -hmm. On the left side of the picture, I believe uh, the little blip coming in in the middle of the left-hand side is a place where there used to be a bench and a trail out to a bench that overlooks the creek. And I'm wondering whether that trail still exists and the bench still exists or whether that whole, the bench has been taken away and the area closed. I haven't been there for a few years and I'm just wondering. The, there is a bench out to an overlook. Um, and mm -hmm. and it, we wanted to, we'd like to try to keep that overlook accessible. Uh, you know, there is an existing trail to that, uh, to the edge of the creek. Uh, and we'd like to try to keep that open. It, it's still a nice shaded spot. Uh, it's still a, a good spot for contemplation and that sort of stream side uh, experience. You know, we're cognizant of of the good that people get out of, of visiting these riparian areas. Um, absolutely we are. Um, and, and we wanted to try to keep that available and, and open, you know, fence to discourage people from going into the mm -hmm. creek, but uh, still have uh, the ability to go up to the creek. I, I like that idea. I have used that spot exactly as you described, but there, there have been numerous social trails from there down to the creek that have denuded the the side of the creek. And so that's a great idea to have a fence there, even though it's not shown on this diagram. Can I inter interject one more time? This is Megan. Um, so Karen, maybe you and Adam and I can have a, a side side conversation about this. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to. Um, I suspect you're talking to a, a trail that we had decommissioned a few years back, um, but we, are, we do have designated access off of the spur trail. And so that's a community conversation for sure to be had. Um, but let's just make sure that you and Adam and I are talking about the same location. So I'm oh, happy. Yeah, and that, yeah, now I'm feeling less certain that, that you and I, Karen, were talking about the same spot. I, the, yeah, that little, that little jog in the yellow that then connects with the orange off of the spur trail is no, what I'm I was talking at, I'm talking about the very left-hand edge of the image for figure five. Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry. I, I was, we were talking about different spots and thank you, Megan, for pointing that out. That is, yeah, that is a, a social trail that we have attempted to close uh, and are continuing to try to close. We've tried to rehabilitate uh, and restore that trail and that area will be fenced off um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to stop access there because it is a main, that is the main access for the, the spider web network of undesignated trails south of the Dunn House. And we would really like to get that, uh, that social trail network under control and get some quality restoration in that area. 
So there's fencing in that area, even though it's not shown on figure five. Well, the hope is that the fencing along the Dunham House loop will exclude people from going oh. uh, west and south. OK, I got okay. it. We can talk further about this, for sure. Certainly, you know? yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And at the top of that page, there's uh, some hieroglyphics that I don't understand. What is eight hyphen three hyphen three? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, an eight, an eight three three is is what we refer to as the city manager rule. So that's the regulatory closure. Oh, 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 that's a code number. Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, are there any more questions here? I just have one small comment, Adam. You mentioned that um, you were satisfied with some of the success you saw on tall oak grass control. Um, I'd love to go see that. I was at NCAR the other day and believe I saw what looked to me like some pretty stunning success in the area that this board field tripped in the prior year. Um, Dan, is that is, is that true? It's, it's exciting. Here. In fact, I'll, I'll have a, a brief uh, director update on some of our tall oak grass work up on Shanahan Ridge. Oh, okay. I think Adam is referring to some riparian area of restoration, which is separate from uh, the grazing management areas up on Shanahan. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll provide you with just a very quick update on, on that project uh, in just a bit. Great. Yeah, my larger point was it's just very satisfying to see when you guys do strategize on invasive species that we start to make progress and we start to make headway. So thank you very much for putting together such a cohesive strategy. Absolutely, we've had a lot of, it's been a big team effort and and Megan has been crucial on uh, getting that, so the, the restoration and weed treatment and all that uh, underway and, and we're feeling good about how things are moving along. Thank you so much, Adam. Absolutely. Oh, Karen, Karen has her hand up, yep. I, I, uh, were you ready to close this out? Because I have one more question. No, no, please, please ask your okay. question. Yeah. Okay. Um, my concern on page 10 and 11, um, and I don't uh, have any uh, concerns with the strategies you suggested, um, but my concern is based on our experience with our dogs off leash monitoring and, and robust program to try to improve behavior of dogs off leash. And in our adaptive management initiatives in that case, we really failed to have a clear definition of what actions would be triggered if the monitoring showed X. And um, in, I, I sent a, an email uh, last month with, with a definition of, of adaptive management uh, based on the Department of Interior. And it seems to me that, that standard practice in a resource agency is expected to be, if the monitoring shows X, then Y will happen. And so my question is whether staff had that discussion and decided to leave those kinds of triggers out of this document, or whether you're planning on doing that and just haven't gotten to that level of detail yet. But I think before implementation of this plan starts, it's really essential from an implementation point of view that you tell the public in advance, this is the outcome you're seeking and if that doesn't happen, this is going to be the result. So that the public knows what the consequences are of, of making a success out of this versus, you know, sort of doing it half-heartedly. Um, thank you, Karen. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point uh, as to whether we, we have certainly had conversations about um, what sort of triggers we'll see in terms of, you know, ha uh, potential maintenance concerns for infrastructure. For example, we've talked about if there are any cost thresholds uh, for, you know, fence repair once we've seen uh, any issues with uh, the fencing we put in or, or if we see snails uh, in an area we haven't, what 
that could mean in terms of how we adjust those uh, sorts of uh, the management in that area, or even if a new trail goes in an area that is currently doesn't have that sort of use, what that might mean in terms of New Zealand mud snail management. Uh, so th those are conversations that we've had and are continuing to have uh, across the system. John, can you speak any further to that? Yeah, no, I actually, I think you um, handled that great, Adam. The, uh, the kind of repercussions of, of failure here are, um, are, are quite high, Karen. So um, outlining, you know, what, what we would do if snails got introduced here is, is um, sort of, it's a, it becomes a moot point in a lot of ways because the, the key is to just prevent them from getting into the stream altogether. And so they uh, responding to the instances like Adam was describing is, is more the um, immediate direct action that we would take if, if we saw, for example, fences taken down or somehow damaged or uh, new trails going in, or um, hopefully not uh, new introductions of the species in the, in the creek. Thank you. And, and thank you, Adam. Um, and that addresses actions that staff would take if the desired situation were not able to be implemented. But my question is to drive visitor behavior changes. Isn't it helpful to define, you know, what the consequences are and make that very clear to the public in terms of, of if the public doesn't participate in what the staff is doing? I, I, so if we're not seeing compliance in certain areas, what we would do in those instances, is that kind of where, where you're going with that? Yeah. Not, not only what you would do, but, but what the consequences are for the visitors that are, I mean, for all visitors, if, if compliance is not attained. Uh, well, go ahead, John, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that um, the, the primary consequence of um, the public going into the creek, for example, Karen, would, would be uh, this would be a, a enforcement action um, based on the closure. So, so that's the that's the primary response that would happen if somebody is 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 um, in violation of those closure areas. Um, really hope that through this this excellent uh, communication and outreach program that Adam and his team have put together, that we can avoid that situation. And, and as well with all of the, um, the signs and the other, um, you know, uh, newspaper articles and advertisements that, uh, that are being put together, that that can, that, can, that can avoid that sort of enforcement need. But um, that is a consequence if, uh, if people are crossing the fences and going into the creek. I, and, Karen, I, and Karen, I just might add that also the reinforcement of the restoration opportunities that this program is allowing us could provide um, as well a, a future in, uh, an incentive to comply, realizing that there's much more we can do now that, uh, for instance, the South Mesa trailhead area is something that's long been on staff list. We just felt like we couldn't be successful without closure. And now uh, because of New Zealand mud snail, there's that additional benefit of being able to do large scale restoration, which I think most public members would find en enthusiastically embrace. So we could also use that as a, as a double enforcement to uh, kind of urge people why compliance is needed and, and what, what the system will gain from it. I, I have no uh, contradictory uh, views on anything that anybody has said. I just think that, that making the public understand more clearly what the consequences of their behaviors are, that this is not something that the staff alone can pull off. And, and we'll, we'll certainly try to, uh, we have been and will continue to try to communicate, you know, that that this is this is going to be a community effort, uh, and that uh, we're trying to get that across in in what we're putting out in those education outreach in terms of the the mailers and the uh, the ads and all of the things that John mentioned uh, because it really is a, a community effort and you make an excellent point in that 
in that regard. Caroline. Yeah, thank you. Um, just like a couple of quick thoughts going off of what Karen said. Um, so I think it's really good that on our new website, um, when you pull it up, as soon as you scroll down, you do see um, Mud Snail via the tweets um, to talk about that. So um, that's really good that if you visit um, our site, that's the first thing that you see. I don't know. I feel like Steve is always the one that talks about it with the dogs. If there is, and you guys have talked about mailers, if there's a way to um, kind of mass email everyone on um, our off leash list and let them know and, and tell them, you know, if they find mud snails on their dogs, reporting that would be great, letting us know what waterways they were in um, and, you know, maybe letting them know what is pristine. So if they know, you know, their pets have been kind of jumping from puddle to puddle as they've gone through the trails saying, you know what, my dog's been in X stream that, that we know has mud snails, mud, mud snails. So let's make sure um, that we stay out of this portion of the stream um, just because we've already been in invasive water and it only takes one. Um, so maybe those are, are some ideas because I think that, you know, everyone here, if they uh, knew um, how quickly they can spread and, and once they're there, they're there would, would, you know, really be on board to help us you know, protect the water. Yeah, I, I, unless I'm mistaken, I don't remember us discussing uh, the, the off-leash dog uh, email chain or, or distribution list as a potential mechanism to get the word out. So that's, I think that's an excellent idea. I'll bring it up to the group uh, at our next meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Adam, yeah. I just may jo join in too that we may even talk about making sure there's a point of that is the Voice Insight education program. That could be mm -hmm. something too we help elevate. So just another, to your point, Carol and other ways we can continue to enhance the message. So thanks. Great. Yeah, um, thank you. I also see Phil, um, you you turned on and uh, naturally on this, I always come back to the multi-agency app. Yep. Um, so anyway, thank you. Yeah, we're certainly in discussions with uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, how we can jointly put out information and it meets both our objectives. But this is also a lot of great feedback that we can integrate and move forward with um, <clears throat> the way we outreach and communicate with the public. Wonderful. Does anybody else um, have anything else or are we feeling um, good on where we stand with the New Zealand mud snail? Great. Dan, I'm gonna give it back to you again. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you, you so Adam. much, Adam. Thank you, Adam, and thanks for the whole interdisciplinary team that's worked for the past eight months and putting the plans together. And, and now our milestone was coming to you. So uh, very exciting. Uh, and thanks to staff. Well, we're gonna kind of pivot uh, from direct land management to how we fund land management. <laughs> and we're gonna talk uh, uh, our first touch with you about our 2022 operating budget. And we'll have Two folks joining us that you are now used to seeing, uh, Sam McQueen, our business services manager, and Lauren Kilcoin, our central services area manager. So Sam, I see you up front, so I imagine you're first to go. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll share my screen. Okay. While you're doing that, let me just say, uh, thank you for the education on the CIP, the memo. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, trustees. My name is Sam McQueen, and I'm the business services manager. Um, I'm joined tonight by Lauren Kilcoin, the central services manager, to discuss OSMP's draft 2022 operating budget with you. So as Karen just mentioned, and as a reminder of key milestones in the 2022 budget planning process, we discussed the CIP with OSBT at the May and June business meetings. Lauren and I are here tonight to share draft operating budget information, and we'll be returning at the August business meeting for the 2022 operating budget public hearing, discussion, and recommendation from OSBT. Tonight, we'll start by sharing a budget process update then we'll give details on the budget development process. We'll discuss the operating budget structure, the recommended operating budget and submitted budget requests. And then we'll close with time for questions. 
Starting with a budget process update, OSMP presented the draft 2022 operating budget to the executive budget team or EBT on June 23rd. EBT is made of representatives from the city manager's office, the finance department, and a rotating subset of department directors who ensure a consistent city budget approach and responsible fund stewardship. Overall, we heard strong support for the department's approach to developing the 2022 budget and received kudos on connecting the budget to the master plan. We await EBT's decision on OSMP's budget requests, but we're expecting positive results. Up next, OSMP will submit final materials to the finance department for inclusion in the city manager's recommended budget. The planning board will also review the department's CIP on August 19th for potential recommendation to city council. We'll turn our attention to the draft 2022 operating budget. The operating budget is built from the current base year and it's generally assumed that the base budget will continue to be funded year to year. Increases to base require submission of budget requests to EBT. If approved by EBT, they become a part of the city manager's recommended budget. If denied, they'll be removed for consideration ahead of the August business meeting. Next, the finance department provides guidelines that serve as the foundation to project operating budget items, including salary and benefits costs, vehicle repair and replacement and fuel costs, technology costs for a computer replacement fund, telecom and licensing, and debt service costs. The department then overlays any adjustments to core service budgets in the temporary and seasonal staffing and non-personnel budget categories. These costs are adjusted to account for price changes over time and any pay changes. The operating budget consists of four categories, personnel expenditures made up of standard and non-standard personnel or PE costs, non-personnel expenditures and interdepartmental charges within the city of Boulder, cost allocation paid to the general fund for services and debt service costs. While the CIP incorporates some lottery funds, the operating budget expenditures are funded entirely by the open space fund. You may recall that OSMP received general fund dollars in previous years to pay for some positions and services in the operating budget. OSMP no longer receives general fund dollars, but we still partner with other departments through MOUs. Taking a closer look at each of the operating budget categories, personnel expenditures make up 63% of the operating budget. Personnel refers to all salary and benefits costs for standard full-time equivalent or FTE positions and temporary and seasonal positions. The finance department develops an annual personnel model to project salary and benefits costs for standard, personnel, uh, for standard positions only. A standard FTE is assumed to be an ongoing part of the department's staff capacity and base budget and one FTE is modeled at 2,080 hours per year in the department's work plan. To make changes to personnel modeling, including the addition of FTEs, OSMP submits budget requests to the executive budget team for review. The department creates our own model for temporary and seasonal costs. As we discussed at the June business meeting, OSMP has a goal for 2022 to return to pre-COVID staffing levels. Next are the non-personnel expenditures or NPE. NPE makes up 22% of the operating budget. Interdepartmental charges to other city of Boulder departments are included as part of NPE. They serve as a cost savings mechanism for many major purchases and provide consistent and predictable services year over year for expenses like technology and vehicle costs. NPE is largely core service projects and programs and supports key field work. This includes smaller scale contracted work like invasive tree removal, equipment and materials such as chainsaws for forestry and crusher fines for small trail repairs, funded research and studies by other agencies, including Preble surveys and training and PPE costs like wilderness first aid and post certification. The final expenditures in the operating budget are cost allocation and debt service. Cost allocation makes up 8% of the operating budget. The cost allocation plan is developed by the finance department and assigns indirect general fund costs to departments. 
Examples include city attorney's office support, HR services, and IT costs. An update to the city's cost allocation plan is delayed until 2022. While there is a decrease of about $70,000 in cost allocation for the open space fund in 2022, we don't expect that trend to continue. Debt service is the last category of operating budget expenditures. Debt service on bonds and annual payments to the Boulder Municipal Property Authority, or BUMPA, make up 7% of the operating budget. It includes repayment of a 2014 general obligation bond, which supported the last iteration of land acquisition in OSMP. Debt service also includes property acquisition payments to BUMPA for Ertl acquisition in 2013 and Lippincott acquisition in 2018. OSMP receives an offsetting 50% revenue from Jefferson County for Lippincott. I'll turn it over to Lauren from here to discuss the operating budget. Thanks, Sam. So to, to start out with, just to give you a sense of the overall operating budget structure, you have seen this as a pie chart in previous years, um, and that was not a popular display. So we're making it just a switch, but it gives you the same information. Um, and the goal of this, this is like highest level before we start to dig next level down. The goal of this is to show um, by service area and by category, like Sam just walked through, where are we allocating the dollars in our operating budget? So our goals are always to invest the uh, greatest share of our operating budget in the boots on the ground, the projects and programs, the stewardship and maintenance, like the, the work out on the system to get things done. So where I first look to that is in the community connections and partnerships, resources and stewardship and trails and facilities budget. Um, those each have about 21% of the operating budget, but that does not mean that they're funded at the same level or that they have similar breakdowns in the categories that Sam just described of personnel, seasonal intent, non-personnel, et cetera. Uh, we have office of the director at 7% and central services at 15%. And you also see the cost allocation and debt payment expenditures there as Sam already outlined. Next slide. So from that very high level, we're then able to use the two financial statements that are attached in your packet to provide more detail and, and uh, draw some, some additional conclusions. So this revenue snapshot was not in the packet, it is in the attachment, but I want to walk through revenues because this was a place where you all had a good amount of feedback last year and we've tried to incorporate that and hopefully it's been uh, beneficial as we've gone through the 2022 process. So the greatest share of our revenue is net sales tax, sales and use taxes, that is managed by the finance department and the, the tax and licensing group out of that department. So we work very closely with those folks. Joel Wagner manages that team, uh, previously was our flood recovery coordinator. So we have a really close working relationship to understand what types of revenues we're gonna be seeing in net sales and use taxes. The other revenues that you see there are managed by the business services team in partnership, of course, with the rest of staff. So. Uh, in particular, the, the next line down here, agricultural and caretaker leases, this is something that you all asked for more information on as we went through last budget process to break that out. So you can see uh, about 450000 in actual revenue in 2022 with some slow growth as we think about uh, some new leases and, and uh, revenue increases based on some specific leases. And then the next line down, you can see our investment income. So that is the income that we earn through investment of our unappropriated fund balance. The city invests those dollars in some low risk areas and we're generating revenue off of that. Um, the miscellaneous revenue category used to be my sort of catch all and that has been very much reduced to just what truly is miscellaneous. So um, hopefully that is more clear and transparent. And then real estate sales and pass throughs is another one that we pulled out as a separate line item. So you can see in 2020, we have the revenue coming in from the sale of um, the Coleman and Suits houses. And then as a projection in those future years, you see exactly what Sam was describing. That's Jeffco's share of the Lippincott bump of payment. So could we get other sales and passers potentially, but what we know upfront, what we're able to plan for is that we're getting that offsetting revenue from Jefferson County. And then the last one here is uh, the special activity charges, permits and fees. So those are all the programs that we're running, whether that's voice and sight or commercial and special use. Woodlot, um, you know, anything like that where we have point of sale systems where maybe over the front desk or, or through the admin team, um, those folks are collecting those revenues. 
grants, that's one where we, we try not to anticipate that we will get a grant. If we do get a grant, we notice that through, we, through the adjustment to base process and then we add it as an appropriation to our budget. Uh, obviously 2020 with everything going on in COVID was not a big grant year for us, but we would update that as we get grants and not make the assumption that we would win a grant process. Next slide. So Lauren, what are the red and green arrows? Oh, thank you. Those are, um, I should have taken a cleaner snapshot. Those are, I have extensive notes on every field on the fund financial. Those are my notes to myself around uh, when we would have gotten the most recent sales and use tax projections, what categories are looking good and what categories aren't looking so good. Notes to myself that I should have cleaned up for the purposes of the snapshot. So I apologize about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and then this is uh, the, where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. This is the operating budget on the uses of funds section of your fund financial. So what I would be looking for here as I approach the 2022 budget would be, are there any significant departures? Are there any significant changes from what we've done in the past? So you can see we have no changes really to the way that we're structured. We have our service areas. We talk about carryover, cost allocation, et cetera. Um, but what you can see as you compare 2021 revised to 2022 recommended is we're making increases in all of those categories. We're making increases in CIP and across those five service areas. And that is largely attributable, as it said in the packet, to restoration of COVID cuts. So Sam mentioned that we have a goal to restore COVID cuts. Revenues came in better than expected. We have a budget request that Sam will talk about to fully restore. So we feel like we're able to fully restore everything that we cut. Um, and, and uh, make some, some positions ongoing that, that Sam will talk about shortly. And then in the CIP, we've talked about that at length as we went through the process, but we were able to start programming some of the $0.15. We anticipate if you're looking in the out years of the fund financial, 2023 plus, that we'll be able to continue to grow some of these areas. We have not fully programmed the 0.15 in the 2022 budget, but we wanted to first make sure we could sustainably add back all of those dollars and prepare ourselves for a, a post-COVID world where we're going about our work and implementing everything we said we were going to implement. Um, a couple other things I would, I would point out, you can see in 2020 actuals, you have this big lump sum under capital improvement program. And one might ask, uh, if you cut your CIP so much in COVID, how did you end up spending almost $11 million? $8 million of that was the Shanahan Ranch acquisition, which was funded in previous years and carried over and that acquisition closed in 2020. So you see it reflected there. So the other 2.8 is what we managed to spend in our CIP, which all things considered when we were down 134 seasonals and a bunch of standards and a bunch of budget, uh, we felt very good about. In 2021, I'll call out the 13.4 million under the carryover ATV operating line. And we provided detail on what made up that number in the April packet, but what we're looking at there is a combination of any unanticipated revenues that we've gotten since the 2021 budget and all of our capital carryover projects that we funded in previous years that we have not finished and we're carrying over the budget to support those. So to call out a few big ones, the 5.3 million that we collected in 2020 to pay for that conservation easement at, at Long's Gardens, that revenue needed to carry over to 2021 in order to close on that, that purchase. And then we have the balance of the acquisition CIP at about 3.5 million. And that's uh, what's left after spending down our previous acquisition CIP and the $10 million bond that Sam was just talking about. And then there are you know, probably two dozen capital projects that are, are multi-year and still active in the current year, but were funded in a previous year. So uh, again, the April packet has more information on that, but if I was looking at this, I would zero in on, on that large number and have some questions. So, there's the context for that. Um, so in total, what you're looking at is a, about a $30.5 million budget. But obviously tonight, we're very focused in on the operating side. The difference, of course, is in the CIP, um, whether that be from the open space fund or the lottery fund. Next slide. So we know that the fund financial is limited, and it is meant as a tool for the CAFR for our annual financial reports. So every fund has one and they roll up into our financial statements. And we know that those don't give the level of detail that you're looking for. And so we have the department detail page as attachment B to provide, again, a next level down uh, more transparency and more information. So 
each service area, and I've highlighted my own just because I can talk about it easily. Um, it, each service area is broken into either work groups or programs. Our goal was to model our organizational chart. And so you see here the three work groups that make up central services. But we also have this remnant of priority based budgeting from 2013, where we went through a process citywide and with the community to say uh, what what programs in particular do you want to see us tracking over a longer time frame. So you see things show up in the detail page like the junior ranger program, the human dimensions program, uh, forestry, uh, uh, different types of restoration plan ecology. So even though in our organizational chart, those would roll up into a work group, we've made that commitment from 2013 to continue to report on those. So there aren't huge levels of flexibility, but we hope that it's additional information above and beyond what you would have seen in the fund financials. So for central services, a couple of things I'd be looking at here would be in the variance column. So have we changed the staffing level from 21 to 22? And have we changed the overall budget amount from 21 to 22? So in this service area, you can see that we decreased 0.75 FTE from business services. So what we do in the department, as Sam, as Sam mentioned, this budget is larger, but it's less flexible. And it's less flexible because our FTE are considered ongoing. If somebody holds a position, they generally hold that position until something happens. So what we had in this case was a retirement of a longtime administrative uh, specialist in, in the department. And anytime that happens, we take the opportunity to say, where is the greatest need? Do we need to make any adjustments? And frequently we say, no, fill it. We had a recent vacancy in the vegetation supervisor. We needed to fill that role as it already existed. And we went forward and made a post, uh, job posting for that. For this position, we had an opportunity to redirect some capacity to accelerate in some other areas. So we actually broke this one FTE into 4.25 increments. We gave a 0.5 to forestry, and what that allowed us to do is take two forestry crew leads who work three quarters of the year and make them year round. And we did the same thing with a 0.25 going to facilities where we were able to make a, a program lead go from 0.75 to year round. So those are ways that even though we're less agile in some of these areas, we can take these opportunities to make sure that we're investing and accelerating in places where we need to go. So on the detail page, you would see increases in that variance column uh, to total to that 0.75. On the funding side, you would be able to, to, to look at by the pro, you know, by program, what are what would make up some of those costs. So if I was looking at business services, I can tell you 550,000 of that is the lease on the hub. If I was looking at resource information services, that's the telecom computer replacement fund, all of the licensing, uh, you know, everything that Sam already mentioned as a savings mechanism for technology. So hopefully this gives you a uh, place to, to dive in. A big request from you all last year was we want to see more numbers and uh, hopefully we've delivered on that. Next slide. So another, another, another place we wanted to provide more information and, and Michelle had asked about this during the CIP process, but you all have asked about it as well. The, because we're one of the few departments that has a seasonal and temporary workforce, the city structures for reporting headcount don't fit us super well. Um, they only factor in those standard FTE positions. And so as a department, you see 126.35 as our headcount. There's another 209 employees in this department who are doing critical work for us in taking care of our land system and they don't get captured in that in that document. So in the packet, we've provided that at the work group level for the purposes of fitting on the slide. I just rolled it up to the service area level, but this is more or less what you would expect. So Office of the Director and Central Services, very few temps in those areas. Community connections and partnerships, about 115 of those folks are attributed to the Junior Ranger program, whether that's the youth or the team leads or the program assistants. Um, and the others are supporting presence in the field, out doing um, education and outreach programming uh, and, and working out on the system. And then as you might expect, resources and stewardship and trails and facilities have the largest share of our temporary staff. We have RNS at 41, and that would be, you know, ag, vegetation, water, et cetera. And we have a tendency to hire more of those positions in-house uh, because of the, the sort of nuance and specificity in, in managing this particular land system compared with the ability to contract out or hire out in some other parts of our business. Trails and facilities have 27. 
one of Michelle's questions during the CIP was around um, the trails program. And so we've tried to, to reflect that they have a, a good amount of capacity in the seasonal and temporary category in that program. Next slide. And so the, the last sort of display of information from me before I kick it back to Sam is um, how, do we, how do we then take those categories Sam was talking about, PE, MPE, et cetera, and overlay our organizational structure. And so this is what this graph is trying to accomplish where you can see the breakdown by all of our operating categories and then by standard personnel, temp and seasonal, non-personnel, et cetera. So what I would be looking at when I was looking at this graph um, is where is the greatest share of the money going in the operating budget? You can see in community connections and partnerships, that's the greatest share of our standard personnel budget that is largely attributable to the Ranger program. Sam mentioned post-certification, which is our peace officer certification. We have EMS and fire and all sorts of other training that goes into that, in addition to the, the personnel costs of having those folks. Um, temporary and seasonal, we've already talked about it. We have a tendency to, to hire more temporary and seasonal staff in the resources and stewardship area. And then you can see in trails and facilities, the NPE, um, we have contracts uh, in that space to do, um, well, you've seen like our youth core contracts and other ways that we're augmenting capacity in that space. And the facilities group also pays for vehicle repair and replacement, um, any of our equipment upgrades, equipment replacement, all of our PPE, our cleaning materials, our supplies. And so you have a greater share of NPE in that service area than you would elsewhere. Cost allocation and debt service are technically a non-personnel expense. We don't consider them to be that when we talk about how we invest money in stewardship and maintenance on the ground but those are reflected there for our total budget of about 25 and a half million. So with that, I will hand it back to Sam to talk about our specific budget requests. Thank you. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that any increases to base budget require submission of a budget request to the executive budget team. If approved by EBT, they become part of the city manager's recommended budget. If denied, they'll be removed for OSBT consideration ahead of the August business meeting. OSMP presented the following budget request to EBT on June 23rd and awaits their recommendation. OSMP requested to restore COVID-19 reductions in 2022 to scale up to pre-COVID maintenance budgets. We shared at the June business meeting that we'll hire into position vacancies by the end of 2021 for a cost of $321,000. We'll also restore $980,000 in non-personnel expenses across functions and services. 458,000 of the 980 will be programmed back to service areas to align with pre-COVID operating budgets. 522,000 will be used to advance tier one master plan priorities. Those include preserve and restore important habitat blocks and corridors, address the global climate crisis here and now, assess and manage increasing visitation, and reduce trail maintenance backlog. Restoration of COVID-19 reductions has a total impact of $7.8 million over a six-year fund financial horizon. OSMP now has the, the approved preferred alternative approach and approved resource information services strategic operating plan to guide future work in the department. To implement guidance from these plans, OSMP also submitted budget requests to make five temporary and fixed term positions ongoing to continue department priorities. The requests are budget neutral and do not require additional dollars. The positions are tied to soil health, Prairie Dog Management, Ecology, Human Dimensions, and GIS. For our next steps, we'll be coming back to you in August to discuss the 2022 operating budget for recommendation. We also have a goal to more closely connect the operating budget to the master plan in future years. We'll discuss this goal with you in more detail at the fall OSBT retreat. And with that, that concludes our presentation. Um, does the OSBT have any questions regarding the department's draft 2022 operating budget? Karen. Uh, you're on mute. Well, you're good. I think I'm unmuted, am I? Good. 
Thank you. And thank you, Lauren and Sam. And I want to correct myself. I didn't mean CIP, I meant operating budget. And, and this, uh, this memo really does a great job of explaining everything and what happens and how it happens. And thank you for doing it. I'm sure it was a labor of love as you went through and explained every step in the process for, for a layman who is not a budgeteer. <laughs> um, a couple of quick questions. In the resource information services category, is GIS mapping included there? So the whole mapping staff is part of that? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thanks. Um, and then uh, on, hold on. Uh, the ranger services on page six, uh, table three, um, somewhere in the last month or two, uh, I read or heard that due to adjustment to base, there were additional rangers hired. Um, but it, it looks like given this information that we've had 19 rangers for at least three years in a row. So what kind of additional rangers and where and how and explain that to me. Yeah, thank you. And, and Dan or Mark can chime in. Those are actually to be managed by other departments. So uh, Parks and Rec, I believe, has, has oversight over that. And I, I'm sure that we are uh, assisting them in developing those positions and, and talking with them about the way we run our program, but those will be housed in other departments. So they're rangers, but not OSMP rangers. That's correct. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks. And um, Then on attachment A, my last request to you <laughs> for major improvement <laughs> is to put attachment A landscape so that the font size can be enlarged just a little bit. I'll, uh, I'll look at Leah. Leah, we, we, can, we can probably make that happen. <laughs> um, it's the magnifying I, glass. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, th those of us who read the PDF, we can make it whatever size we please at any time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, under uh, special activity charges, permits, and fees, um, why was it $70,000 higher in 2020? Yes, um, I have that line item detail, which will take me a mo moment to pull up. It was it was nothing big. We had small increases in the number of things that were sold in almost every category. So I think we had um, an extra five to ten thousand dollars in voice and site revenue, um, an increase. We we merged our program for the woodlot with Parks and Rec to offer more permits and more available um, options for folks to go get those. We saw increases there. We thought we would see decreases in commercial and special use, but it was uh, we, we didn't take any hits there really. Facility reservations were slow when we had restrictions in place for COVID and then folks kind of rescheduled them to later in the year and we saw that rebound. So um, there, was, there was nothing that had an astronomical increase and everything had a, had a bit of a steady increase. So I, am I correct in assuming based on what you said that it was a reflection of increased use in the system in all those categories? Um, I'm trying to think if we had any fee schedule changes and I don't think any of them were significant. So yeah, I, and again, it would, it would huh. I, the permit program typically grows a little bit year over year. Interesting. Uh, yeah, th things like that, but it's certainly nothing astronomical. In the out years, we, we kind of assume a two to 3% growth in those categories um, in terms of the revenue that we're see seeing each year. So it, it, it's not inconsistent with what we've seen in any other year. And, and when was the last time we increased fees like commercial fees and those sorts of fees? Yeah, it's been, it's been quite some time. Um, I asked Casey French that recently about commercial and special use. And I think we did some sort of program update there about maybe a decade ago. Wow, sounds like it's time to relook at that this year. 
Yeah, and I think some of that is um, is baked into some of the upcoming planning processes as we think about increased visitation and recreation management. So I would anticipate that to be part of the conversation like wrapped into that process. Okay, great. Um, and then my last question on this attachment A is in the bumper line. Yes. Um, the big drop between 2023 and 2024 is because what ends? Ertl. Oh, Ertl. Okay. Yes, we paid off. Um, we paid off Lucetta last last year, so that was about a seventy-five or eighty thousand dollar ongoing decrease to budget that we were able to reallocate. When Sam says uh, accelerate tier ones, we're looking at things where we paid it off or don't need to restore and we're accelerating. So Lucetta was paid off and then Ertl will be paid off in 2023. Great, thank you. And and you get an A and next year it's gonna be an A plus if we can make that table horizontal. <laughs> I can't tell you how grateful I am for Sam. I will say that. <laughs> I see Dave. Yeah, I'm, I wanna echo that. This was, uh, light years ahead of what uh, previous uh, memos have been and it's been uh, very helpful. Uh, so excellent work and thank, thanks you guys. I have a, a question that actually kind of evolves into a suggestion and that is on the table that, you're, that you showed or that is in our memo on staffing. So F um, uh, FTE, seasonal temporary, I am wondering if it would be worthwhile to put uh, another column of volunteer volunteers. And the reason for that is that I don't think there's any other department in the city that utilizes volunteers to get the department's work done as much as the open space and mountain parks department. And I think you know, city leaders, uh, the, fin the finance group, uh, you know, the budget group should understand that, that it's not only, you know, regular FTE and seasonal temporary positions, but in order for the department to accomplish what it does, it depends on a major volunteer component. And I don't know whether it's worth attributing you know, kind of expenses or expenditures necessarily in this document or in your, in your uh, budget uh, information, but it just strikes me that that's one part of the workforce that, that, you know, is never acknowledged in the budget per se. Now it's acknowledged to us and to the community kind of through annual reports and things like that, but I think it's definitely worth uh, trying to highlight it in a third column as far as uh, departmental staffing is concerned. Just as FTE equivalents, is that what yeah, you're suggesting? Right. Yeah. yeah. That That's a really interesting, interesting suggestion. I just want to use this opportunity, Dave, to thank you for raising that and just to call out that Janelle Freeston is leading. Uh, the citywide, we have what is called a, the volunteer cooperative which is made up of uh, city staff and in which several directors sit on. And I have the pleasure of sitting on that committee. And our city manager does attend. Uh, the police chief attends. Uh, Alley Roads and Parks and Rec attends. Uh, community Vitality. So there is definitely a citywide leadership recognition of the importance of the volunteer program. And we do come up with our own estimates that Janelle can probably attest to of how much dollar value do we think we're getting from our volunteers? But you are right. We kind of treat that report separate from then this report and kind of merging those in some ways is a really interesting idea. I think that would be uh, not only helpful for the board and, and the community, but also in the you know, budget discussions, especially if, you, if the department's anticipating you know, other staffing needs you know, you might be able to, to point to the volunteer role as filling those needs, but maybe not as, um, you know, specifically or as much as you really actually need. So somehow use that as, you know, part of the staffing conversation uh, for future consideration. Right. Thanks. <laughs> but an excellent, excellent memo. I really appreciate it. <laughs>
I, um, I also really agree. I'm uh, very impressed by this year's presentation. Um, and actually, I don't have any questions, but just a, uh, some positive commentary to add. I think it's easy when we look at these spreadsheets, we get focused on the technical. And it's important to sometimes celebrate um, if there's something structurally beautiful going on to call that out. And I think it's a nice moment to do it. Um, we just lived through a dramatic crisis with the pandemic. And when I look at these numbers, um, I can't help but think about the real genius that occurred in the 1960s in this community to set up a program of environmental prote protection using a sales tax, which would allow us in this uh, inflationary environment, which is ensuing, to not run into significant budget trouble and to have a um, a department which is going to be well funded and that is going to grow as the monetary base grows and will be insulated from some problems that many other municipal departments around the country will uh, certainly be facing, especially those who have issued a lot of debt in the past. Um, one thing I thought that's really interesting is um, given that we are actually receiving uh, almost as much money in investment income as we are paying on debt. I think it's fair to say we're a pretty low leverage position, which is also worth pointing out because it means we have a lot of flexibility and options to address potential problems in the future. So um, not only do I appreciate the great work, it's just from time to time you look at it and it's actually totally mind blowing um, what people set up for this department and this community and the thought process behind the finance going all the way back to the 60s it's truly remarkable and worth celebrating. So thank you guys for managing it so well. Thank you. Um, just, uh, uh, I thought I'd point out just looking at sales and I'll ask Lauren to chime in on this. Uh, Boulder, um, you know, there is some vulnerability in being totally uh, sales tax dependent, uh, especially in the Boulder area in which we, and compared to our neighbors, we've actually seen a, uh, we saw decreases in sales tax revenue if you exclude um, monies that we're collecting from uh, businesses that are outside the area, online businesses. The, the ability now to collect sales tax from online businesses has really uh, saved Boulder in some regards because our actual sales tax revenues have not grown like Lafayette and Louisville and some of our outlining communities as they've get set up to be more independent communities. Uh, so I believe about a year or two ago, we uh, we were able to really through uh, law changes and everything able to more robustly collect from online uh, businesses, which really quite frankly has, has saved us in some ways. So I don't know if Lauren or Sam wanna add to that, but I just thought I'd add that uh, element. No, I, I think that's exactly right. And um, the other places where things could have been worse in COVID than they were, we had we had a lot of one-time revenue in the area of business use and construction use. And that's not something that we can count on or predict necessarily. And so when you look at places where we will grow revenue and, and have opportunities to level out in periods of decline, it's, it's the things, Dan, that you just described. So uh, we're fortunate the partnership with CU is really helpful and supportive. So see you that, that those are the economists that partner with the city to do those forecasts and projections. And we tend to take the most conservative of those, uh, but we're able to hone in a little bit more on trends like that to, to help us plan our work. So that's great. Wonderful. Does anybody else have questions? Um, I, I believe this is an informational topic. We look forward to seeing you again at the next meeting. Um, We'll have another chance to look it over. Is everybody good for today? Yeah, I am. I just wanted to say um, thank you to you guys. This was a really wonderful presentation. Um, really, really great job. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Great. Well, of course, uh, big thanks to Lauren and Sam. And, and as you all know, every time we have a chance to talk to you, we do like to tout that developing our budget is is definitely an all hands on deck, of course, co coordinated through uh, the effort of central services, but uh, all of our uh, service area managers, all of our supervisors, staff, uh, it really is a, 
all hands on deck and, and we're really proud of the system we've put in place on how we uh, first identify priorities and then try to get the resources to those. So um, I think tonight's reflection from all of you is, is really a, a kudos to all the staff. So I just wanna point that out. Um, all right, so I've got a few uh, verbal updates before we head to our public hearing item for tonight. And one of it is a, a, a little bit of a reference to something that was made earlier tonight. And that is a quick update on, on the tall oak grass control and fire mitigation efforts that are occurring out on Shanahan Ridge. Um, and as the trustees and council members know, uh, spring cattle management has been effective in helping us to control the spread and the pervasiveness of the invasive tall oak grass and also in reducing the fuel loads uh, that accumulate in uh, tall oak grass thatch uh, over the years. And to that end, OSMP has expanded the number of uh, cattle management enclosures in the Shanahan Ridge area to four units. And now uh, those four units actually cover about 500 acres in which cattle are rotated in and out uh, for about one or two weeks each during, during the springtime. So this year was a milestone in which it marked the first time uh, that uh, all four enclosures were utilized. And from a land management perspective, we are really super pleased and excited on how well it went as there is already evidence of the effectiveness uh, of the strategies we're beginning to employ, both from a, uh, a reducing fuel loads uh, in the thatch area, as well as uh, uh, the response we're getting in terms of uh, the control of tall oak grass. Uh, but we also do realize that uh, with the expanding, expanding the presence of cattle in this area, even for brief periods of a few weeks during the springtime, it, it has exasperated some recreation-based issues uh, in the area that, and that staff is working to address. So I just wanna point that out. And one area where we have heard some concerns uh, uh, consistently over the past month or two is at the uh, Craigmore connector. And, and, and really, and that is, uh, uh, I really wanna be clear that it's, 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 this is not just because cattle is there now. There's really been a combination of spring moisture, uh, the trail alignment and the use patterns that are in that area, poor drainage, uh, and the presence of cattle have all, uh, all impact the trail conditions at the connector. But towards the sense that staff has been meeting, I personally have been out there a few times this year I know that other staff have been out there considerable more times than that because we're trying to identify some steps we can take that may help. So recently trail crew members uh, began trail work uh, midway up on the uh, uh, Craigmore connector and uh, they will be working their way down closer to the access point uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we expect this work will result in some improvements in the situation but also wanted to point out that this is an area that gets muddy every spring due to a number of factors that I mentioned, and some of which are simply inherent with spring moisture conditions, the trails location, soil characteristics and such. Um, and we've seen those, those problems in previous year, even before cattle was introduced uh, for a couple of weeks uh, in the springtime. So with that regard, staff is considering the, the installation of some modest buck and rail fencing at the connector entrance area that we think will help to better uh, direct visitors. So uh, kind of two messages. We're super excited about the efficacy and about uh, that things are working out there, about all the effort it took uh, staff to do first move from a pilot program to a sort of a more permanent program with infrastructure in place and needed to support that effort while being sensitive to the fact that there's changes up there and the uh, folks that are living in the area or the folks that are used to visiting and frequent the area, the introduction of cattle can be looked at some as an exciting thing and for others, uh, a not so exciting thing. And we recognize that. And so over the years, we're, we'll continue to monitor it uh, we are, of course, uh, receiving feedback from the community will help, will help guide our response and just want uh, this board to know that we are taking actions um, and uh, but also want the community to know that there's some inherent challenges with that area. If we were to start from scratch, we, put, we wouldn't put that trail in as it exists now. It's, 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 it's a bit unsustainable given the soil characteristics, the slope and whatnot. So 
we'll be out there. We'll be monitoring. We'll be doing action. Um, uh, so I just wanted to uh, take the opportunity to acknowledge a milestone and acknowledge uh, some of the feedback we've, we've been getting from the community. And Dan, I, I did want to say, uh, looking back from NCAR the other day at the field trip area, I'm no expert, but visually, the visual quality of the area of action is remarkably different. Frankly, it looks wildly successful, like way beyond what I thought would be possible. Um, and so that's just an excellent sign. Yeah, and I don't know how often um, maybe the other trustees go to that area, but I go frequently and I agree with Dan in hindsight, if the trail just ceased to exist, it, it would honestly be the best way um, to do it. So it, it is often frequently muddy and, and um, issues with people staying on path there. So um, excited to hear um, that the program's going well and is a success. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I want to also add that I'm delighted with the, the uh, tall grass management um, increases and success. Um, the one question that I have is about given the, the braiding on that trail and, and expansion of the trail based on mud probably, um, what is, what is happening, Dan, to prevent a wider and wider and wider and wider trail? I, my concern is that I want to, I don't want to end up having in the system super highways like we now have going through the Chautauqua Meadow. And, and uh, I understand that the trail crew has to do something about the, you know, mud wet season use of the trail that that's making a mess and expanding the use. Um, but what is happening to, to keep the trail on a, a narrow trail bed? Yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, I'm gonna probably turn things over to Steve or Jarrett uh, who may be able to talk more uh, trail speak to you on, on some sol solutions um, about it. So Steve, oh, Steve, I see you popped up. Jarrett, you popped up. I think let's let Jarrett take this one because <laughs> I think he probably has more on the ground. He's going into the high country. I, uh, I actually, yeah. I didn't even choose that, Karen. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, talking to our trail crews, and, and I think Chad's on too, so maybe he may add a little bit more detail because I know he's actually worked in that area on the ground. But similar to when we looked at Tohi a little bit ago, Karen, I was surprised to, to find out the trail hasn't been expanding significantly over the last five, 10 years. Um, it's actually been maintaining its width in a lot of ways. Oh, good. So, <clears throat> which is, so when you talk about super highways, we, we don't think this is going to turn into a 40, 50 foot wide section of trail. That being said, it is an area that is, is in a drainage and sees a lot of water. And so yeah. the crews are working to, to do some fun things to lift the trail with steps and then provide better drainage. Um, Good. But as Dan said a little bit ago, it is in a drainage and long, long term, as we look at implementing other parts of the, the West TSA, we may, we may look at moving other things, but we really want to respect the West TSA right now. Um, and keep it in place. And Chad, I don't know if you have anything to add, having worked on the ground there. Uh, Jerry, you, you did a good job of capturing um, the majority of it, so thank you. Um, I, I would say I was actually out there this morning um, taking a look at what the crews are doing. Um, and, you know, current impacts of braiding, um, you know, we've been concerned for a couple of years about the braiding up higher on the trail, mostly. Um, and we were planning on being out there this year, even before the mud this spring. And the idea is, you know, there's like 20 feet of impact and braiding in some areas. And the goal is, you know, we're going to have a little bit of a wider tread than we used to have of the, the like 23, 24, 24 inches or so. Um, so it's going to be a little wider than that, but we're also going to make it so um, we can, you know, pin the visitors in a little bit with some some like strategic fencing between the um, the, the the shrubs and the trees and things like that. Um, but not like the goal is to not have consistent fencing the whole way up, um, but um, sporadic fencing to to kind of help keep people on on the tread and um, prevent that braiding issue that we've had in the past. Um, and we're also looking at taking a um, adaptive management um, process behind it so that 
we can, um, you know, we're going to repair a certain amount of it. But the goal has always been to take a couple of years to, to repair this so that we can learn from the, the prior years and make adjustments, subtle, subtle adjustments to our design as we learn and as, as we continue to move forward. So, so I, I just want to make that clear that, that it's not like this is the design and we're moving forward and this is what the way it is. is our, our goal is to learn as we go and, and continue to make adjustments. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions about tall oak grass, trails, cattle? <laughs> All right. Just uh, want a, a, a couple other quick call outs. I just want to call uh, attention to the facts. Uh, speaking of trail maintenance, that uh, beginning this Saturday, uh, we will begin a Bluebell Road maintenance project uh, near Chautauqua Meadow where crews will repair and refurbish the surface uh, materials on a portion of this road that has really experienced uh, pretty significant rutting and that's been exasperated by the, the heavy rains we've had, the fortunate heavy rains we've had uh, uh, this year. So um, just wanna make sure I call that out that you will see some crew activity uh, and there may be a need to do uh, some flow stoppage at points, uh, especially where we're uh, at work, and, and, but we'll be out there uh, with the folks necessary in order to uh, uh, deal with uh, usership patterns uh, while we try to get that important work uh, accomplished. And it will go beyond Saturday, it will go into the next week. Uh, but again, uh, uh, that's, that's a road that uh, we, we tend to have to hit uh, every few years. It's uh, the nature of the beast there. Um, next, I just want to daylight, uh, I think you're all aware, but a, a scheduling uh, change for an upcoming OSBT meeting. Uh, the evening of August 4th uh, was originally added uh, to the OSBT meeting calendar to support uh, some presentations and conversations about a couple of different elements on the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation uh, project. I alerted you a few weeks ago that uh, uh, staff is needing some more time on that front. Uh, so it will be a postponement, not a cancellation. We're going to be rescheduling uh, that meeting, but uh, also wanted to take advantage of the fact that we all had that blocked off. And instead of simply just removing it from the calendar, we have uh, transformed that meeting into a field trip. Uh, so just want to make note uh, of anyone uh, uh, listening that isn't aware of that that uh, there'll be an hour earlier start time. We'll be beginning at five and we're gonna be meeting out at the People's Crossing, formerly known as Settlers Park. And hopefully I don't have to say that formally known as for too long, but I just wanted to call that out. And we've got, I think, a, a suite of different uh, uh, projects that we'll have a chance to talk to staff with about and uh, uh, answer questions and, and have just informal discussion on a suite of uh, trail projects, we'll see some uh, forced health and fire mitigation work. Uh, of course, we'll see some signage work uh, around the People's Crossing, uh, some undesignated trail work, uh, restoration work. So we're really looking forward to that and uh, wanted to also honor your requests over the past year and, and, and a half of let's see each other in person more often. So uh, just wanted to call that out, even though I did, uh, uh, mentioned that through an email uh, earlier. Is, is, uh, great. Is that is that all you have on verbal updates, Dan? Or do that, we have... is, that is all I got. Um, Karen, go ahead. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Um, I have been very impressed with the increasing uh, media coverage to let the public know what's happening on open space and mountain parks lands and what staff is doing. And I want to throw out some gold stars to all the people who have worked on that and made it happen. And, and then I have a quick question about the overnight parking at Joder, whether there's any update about that. Um, well, I think I provided an update last month that we did go out and, uh, and notice that there was some lack of sign. So we did go out there and re-sign and, and sign the site. And uh, uh, Rangers have added it as their, uh, they have sort of uh, roving uh, pay attention uh, aspects and that helps them in their decision making of uh, deployment of staff out on the system in terms of patrol. 
So uh, those are the two actions that uh, we've taken uh, uh, over the past month. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any other direct action, but uh, I'd be happy if Mark Davidson knows of any, but uh, those are the two major actions that I'm aware of, Karen. Great, thank you. Wonderful. Well, we are ahead of schedule. We're doing very good, efficient business here. I think we should call a break until 8.15, the appointed begin time for our next agenda item. An unusually long and comfortable break for us, um, <laughs> unless anybody opposes. I think that makes the most sense. Great. Great, we'll be back at 8.15, everyone. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Next up on the agenda, we have a request for a recommendation to approve the purchase of a public trail easement, including access rights for open space purposes over a portion of property located at 6901 North Foothills Highway from Raytheon Holdings for $23,500 per acre and with the purchase price of the easement not to exceed $235,000. Um, for note to the public, this is a uh, public hearing item. The way that this uh, agenda item will unfold is that first we will hear a presentation from the department on the project. Um, there'll then be a period for clarifying questions. Then we will hold a public hearing and then we will return to the board. So Dan, do you wanna take us away on this? Yeah, that's great, Hal. And I'm gonna soon turn this over to uh, other staff members, but uh, before I introduce the staff who will be providing you all with uh, the presentation on the proposed trail easement acquisition across Raytheon, uh, their private property, I first want to acknowledge and recognize the staff effort that has gone into negotiating trail easements that will greatly help, to help the department significantly reduce any ecological impacts uh, that the future North Sky Trail may have on OSMP managed lands in this area. Uh, and you'll hear more about, uh, about uh, some of the benefits in the upcoming presentation. Uh, but I also just want to note from my uh, real estate uh, experience and background that uh, securing the rights to use private property for public, for public trail purposes is really one of the more challenging uh, real estate projects, projects to successfully accomplish for a number of different reasons, as you can imagine. Um, and, and with the case of the North Sky Trail, we're actually talking about two. In 2017, we successfully um, uh, secured a trail easement across uh, Foothills Business Park property. And now we are coming back with a second opportunity to, to, uh, to secure a trail easement across uh, real, uh, um, Raytheon uh, Holdings. And really the opportunity to bring this one forward as well as the 2017 really speaks uh, volumes about the skill and the perseverance uh, of our real estate uh, uh, work group staff that's led by Bethany Collins, as well as the significant advice and knowledge that has been, been provided by many other staff members in the department that has really helped us inform the goals and what the details of these trail easements should be. So I want to express my thanks to all of the staff for the four plus years it's taken to work through these trail easement projects and for, uh, for staff to recognize the importance of them and why the perseverance is called upon. So just wanna call that out. Um, Hal, you've mentioned sort of the sequence, we'll uh, provide the presentation, we'll seek clarifying questions, we'll turn it over to the public hearing and then we look forward to board's discussion and deliberations on the staff recommendation. So with regards to the presentation, we actually have a few sort of goals and objectives in mind. Uh, Bethany will describe in various portions of the presentation, a few of the important details of the Raytheon Holdings Trail easement, as well as uh, how the easements will help uh, the department achieve some of our important goals and objectives. Um, we're also gonna be providing the board with some important background and context setting. Uh, that will really help explain why trail easements are beneficial in this instance. So Steve Armstead is gonna provide some context and background about the North Trail study area plan. Uh, and then Megan Bowes is who you heard from earlier, will jump back on and she's gonna provide some great information and context related to the ecological attributes and characteristics uh, of the OSP lands that are in this area. 
So with it, I believe with the first slide, I'm, I'm gonna introduce Bethany, who I think will uh, get us started. And I think she'll uh, turn things over to Steve shortly after. So with that, uh, Bethany. So Bethany, I can't see you, so I don't know if you're on mute or not. But okay, I... now we're unmuted. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm pushing the wrong button. We, we um, gave you a very long pause, but it got I to. I know. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> good evening, everyone, um, and thank you, Dan, for that great introduction, uh, as well as Hal. You did a, a bit of the introduction to this agenda item tonight. Um, so, uh, Leah, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so with this agenda item tonight, as, as Hal outlined in the memo um, a, a agenda item title, staff is seeking a recommendation to council for approval of the acquisition of the Raytheon trail easement um, uh, together with access uh, over a portion of the property located at 6901 North Foothills Highway. Um, this is from Raytheon's holding, Raytheon Holdings, which is a, a, a corporation that um, actually a, a majority of their staff is out of uh, Massachusetts and East Coast. Um, and that's for uh, $23,500 per acre and with the total purchase price not to exceed $235,000. Um, the Raytheon property is entirely surrounded by OSMP protected lands, including the Beach West and Beach County uh, properties, as well as the Foothills Business Park Conservation Easement and the Foothills uh, uh, Business Park Trail easement that, <laughs> that, it, that overlays that conservation easement that Dan um, mentioned. These are all held jointly except for the trail easement with Boulder County um, and OSMP is the management lead on those properties. Once approved, the trail easement will host a segment of the North Sky Trail, a trail identified for construction to connect the North Foothills Trailhead to the Joder property as part of the council approved North Trail Study Area Plan or the NTSA. The property is the last remaining parcel of the larger acreage previously owned by Beach Aircraft Corporation. Uh, as currently depicted, the trail easement is around 5.7 acres. However, the up to purchase price allows flexibility in the final size during landowner negotiations, trail design, and surveying. As detailed in the memo, the proposed trail easement is a priority due to the guidance outlined in the North Trail Study Area Plan. And again, Steve, Steve Armstead is here to provide that background and context. Leah, go to the next slide. For Steve, please. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, Bethany. Um, so as kind of has been mentioned, the uh, impetus behind this easement acquisition really stems from the North Trail Study Area Plan and specific guidance that was embedded in that plan related to the North Sky Trail that wanted to have staff pursue the original access easement over the business park or conservation easement property, which Dan mentioned we acquired back in 2017. And, and I'll talk a little bit more again to some of the values of that and kind of why that was important guidance that was embedded in the plan. But just where the Raytheon property fits into this is that while it was not specifically kind of asked in the North TSA plan that we pursue the Raytheon, once we did acquire the business park easement, it became clear to staff that with that easement in hand, we could then perhaps look at the adjacent land, the Raytheon property that with an easement perhaps on that property, we could enhance or even um, build upon the values and the benefits that we acquired with the um, business park easement and achieve further good for moving forward with um, kind of achieving some of the plan guidance with an easement across the Raytheon property. So staff began their conversations with Raytheon, which is of course leading up to the, the discussion we have this evening. Uh, next slide, Leah. So within the North TSA, um, I guess it's, it's well known that that entire engagement process um, required an extensive involvement from the staff, from the community, from the board at the time, as well as even from city council with you know, considerable discussion, some very difficult and challenging thinking that had to go in and deliberation, and some also challenging outcomes that had to be decided upon given the scope of what was to be discussed across the whole northwest quadrant of our system, thinking about how to balance and manage visitor access given the, the, 
variety and realm of different ecological values across this area. And in part, kind of one of the, the most important aspects in, of the, the plan and some of the most challenging decision making was around how to make a north-south connection, how to make a connection from the northern part of our trail system and the edge of Boulder out to the Joder ranch system. And those deliberations and careful thinking led to the action item for the um, future construction of a North Sky Trail um, across the uh, North Foothills HCA area, but recognizing that it's an HCA that, and also the ecological values, which we'll hear more about later, that there also had to be some embedded guidance in the plan that helped to elevate the importance of when that North Sky Trail was to be kind of laid out on the ground and actually um, determined where it would go, that we wanted to make sure we were being as careful from, and this was kind of the consideration from the planning process at the time and guidance that was embedded from the board and council at the time to do what could be done to help respect the fact there's elevated resource values, those HCA values. And the map you see here is just an illustration of kind of where the area we're talking about with relevant to the North Sky Trail and the easements, but also just the North Sky Trail going through, you know, a substantial portion there of the, the HCA and how much of this area is actually recognized as part of an HCA quality habitat. So the guidance within the um, North Foothills TSA itself that really is relevant to the consideration of the easements and what we're talking about tonight is fundamentally that recognizing um, with this trail that we needed to be able to do everything possible to think about how we minimize the footprint of that North Sky Trail, really kind of find actions that help minimize the natural resource impacts. Additionally, there's guidance in the plan is to think about how we can utilize any sort of existing infrastructure, existing social trails. There's, you know, a considerable um, knowledge and interest out there is an old abandoned railroad grade, which social trails fall upon. How well can that be incorporated into the trail? Um, all things that help kind of achieve that first point of trying to minimize the footprint and the ecological impacts. Um, going along with that was the recognition that there are a number of different drainages that cross from west to east through this area and trying to be very conscientious of the ways to have that trail intersect those drainages, minimizing the impacts to the wetlands and also any sort of required mitigation that would occur from those crossings that those have to be considerations that were put into trail alignment considerations, as well as, and this is what kind of directly, again, pertains to where we're talking about tonight, is at the time of the TSA plan is to use the best efforts to think about how we could perhaps integrate in the um, business park property into that. And we're taking that a step further tonight by talking about the Raytheon property. Um, next slide, Leah. So, Additional guidance that really is relevant here is, you know, the guidance within the plan that, again, just continues to kind of emphasize the importance to minimize the disturbance where feasible, um, where trail tread has to be created. So if we're not kind of incorporating existing social trail or patterns out on the ground is, again, just to be as light on the land as we can with recognizing when we do need to place new trail. To think again about, here's that um, business park aspect of how to minimize the ecological impacts. And part of that knowledge there is that the quality of the habitats um, vary between what is part of the open space um, properties to the, the west of the private lands, to the west of the business park and the Raytheon property, compared to what's on those properties, given the fact that they have a history of um, higher levels of disturbance, whether because of its industrial past or even current commercial or various activities that occur. And certainly they haven't and don't have the levels of protection that are afforded to the open space side. So um, the opportunity to relocate the trail out of open space, out of the HCA onto these slightly lower quality areas, they're not no quality areas, but lower quality, um, certainly was something that was recognized as a positive benefit um, from the North TSA. And the last kind of guidance that is partially relevant is just the recognition that as we trail is laid across this landscape, that there is an importance, it will be required as part of the HCA, but an ongoing importance that the trail design itself should be, you know, considered as ways that help to encourage and frankly, you know, promote 
ability for people to actually stay on the trail. So sometimes using the terrain, sometimes that's the steepness of the terrain to help keep people on trail itself. So all those factors um, certainly are the guiding kind of principles that were in the North TSA plan that factor into, you know, what has to be thought about with the design of the North Sky Trail and things that are achieved. And I'll I'll talk a little bit more specific about that with this, you know, the easements that we've been pursuing. Next slide, Leah. So what are the, really the relevance of these, the easements? And I'll start first just thinking and stepping back to when we, you know, originally thought about where the uh, conceptual alignment of the North Sky Trail would go if we couldn't or didn't have access onto either the Foothills Business Park property at the time or even kind of you know, access onto what we're talking now with the Raytheon. And, I, and I'll refer to the map to the left, the one that just has the yellow and the blue lines on it. So you can see in the red outline is the North Foothills or the business pro property itself, the Foothills Business Park. And then in the middle, kind of a little bit of, use a little imagination, there's a shoe shaped or an odd shaped property right in the middle, that's the Raytheon property. So the blue line, represents kind of the continuation of that social trail, the railroad grade that crosses um, from Open Space Mountain Parks property to the um, south and goes north across the business property line, which actually dead ends right at, close to the Raytheon property where there's the big security fence out there. Um, absent any ability to have access onto either of those properties, the North Sky Trail in a conceptual sense would have to depart the railroad grade trail at a location, you know, further south than the property line of the business park in the intersection with the railroad grade, um, and then go up and around those private properties to continue north to eventually go out to the Joder property. So one of the goals here, again, from guidance from the plan is to utilize the existing trails or infrastructure on the ground. And that kind of also aligns with minimizing new tread, also minimizing resource impacts or disturbance. So a goal is certainly attained by doing the best we can to continue to overlap the use of the North Foothills Trail onto the old abandoned railroad grade and the existing social trail as long as we can. So I refer then to now to look at the map on the right, which introduces the orange line on the map. So in reference to this, that now with at least the business park easement at play, Instead of going up and needing to go around to the west of the business park, the opportunity is at hand for the North Sky Trail to continue along the blue line from the south going up north towards the business um, park property and into the business park property, given the easement along that blue line to approach closer to the Raytheon, but we still need to get up and around um, given the requirements in the what easement land we were able to from the business park up and absent the Raytheon up around the Raytheon property. Um, but it still allows from that where you can see where the orange line junctions off of the blue, a, a larger extension of trail to be utilizing the railroad grade before um, it has to kind of climb up slope to get um, up and around the, the Raytheon property and kind of many of the structures there in the Raytheon property. Um, with the Raytheon property, now you can see how that instead of going around the Raytheon property, with a potential easement on the Raytheon property, we're actually able to continue um, an alignment for the North Sky Trail um, lower on the slope, utilizing part of the Raytheon property to keep the trail additionally out of more of open space, out of the HCA property to continue north, where eventually at the northern edge of, edge of the business park property, we need to junction back into the kind of the original proposed alignment for the North Sky Trail. So hopefully that made sense if I, as I walked through that, but the values we're kind of gaining here are multiple. One is that we are using them, they're able to utilize the railroad grade and the existing social trail um, for a longer stretch before needing to leave it to, to navigate to the north. Um, as we stay lower on the slope in general, the, um, and especially related to the North uh, Business Park property and the Raytheon property, the quality of the habitats diminish, diminish. And you're going to hear a lot more about the qualities of the HCA from Megan here in just a few moments. The nature of the drainages and the ability for us to locate the trail through those drainages um, changes in the sense that to the west of the private properties, 
um, the drainages become significantly steeper, deeper canyons, um, wider, deeper riparian zones associated with those, which are both a greater problem from an ecological value, but also a greater challenge for us to actually design a trail managing the steepness of slopes and to put infrastructure in, you know, talking about bridges to span those drainages. As we look lower and as we're talking about the potential of the alignment going through the Raytheon, that presents a situation where those drainages tend to be narrower, the vegetation narrower, and presents new opportunities for us to reduce the extent or even maybe the likelihood that we need as many bridges to be involved in crossing the drainages throughout this span. So significant gains in ability to kind of meet those TSA guidances by the incorporation, not only the business park, but the Raytheon um, easements to help with the alignment of the trail. Um, and as I mentioned, not only the ecological, the design and trail sustainability features are improved as well as we don't have to navigate those technicalities of the steeper drainages. So some of the aspects of what we were able to gain from the application of the Raytheon um, easement that kind of builds off of the success we've had with the foothills and then also helps us achieve those North TSA guidance. So with that, I'll turn it over to Megan who can share a lot more about the ecological values and the importance of that area. Next slide, Leah. Maybe there's an unmute to be done. Megan, unmute. Yep. I think you're on mute, Megan, forgive me. Yep, there we are again. So what I attempted to say was, um, most of you are well aware of what an HCA is. Habitat Conservation Area is a large area of habitat that um, supports naturally functioning ecosystems, uh, generally speaking with low uh, human visitation levels. As part of the um, 2005 Visitor Master Plan, uh, the management goal was to maintain, enhance, or restore the sensitive natural areas. So, so that's our goal. So it's not that we don't allow off-trail travel, but we try to minimize it and we try to track it when we do have it and, and, and whatnot uh, with, the, with the hope of supporting these ecosystems. This North Foothills HCA is a, is a large, relatively unfragged, an unfragmented habitat block it's got a whole mosaic of, of um, ecotonal grasslands, woodlands, upland or riparian shrublands. Um, if you look at the, the map here on, on, on the slide, these have been mapped as what we, we have defined as conservation target, which was um, a management strategy that we came up with as part of our uh, grassland ecosystem management plan. We've sent ex expanded it to include um, work that we've done in the foothills with the West CSA and whatnot. Um, so you can see the the purple um, is the zero tall grass, which I'll talk talk about in a little bit. Um, and then a lot of a lot of shrublands, which is also equally important. So Leah, thank you. Next. So when we look at, at these habitats here, the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, if those of you that are not familiar with them, they actually track uh, conservation targets of, of various important uh, plant communities, which in, in turn feed into um, important wildlife communities. So um, definitely these, these um, shrub communities like Mount Mahogany hogbacks, which you see in the upper middle, um, but also uh, Zurich tall grass communities are, are really important. Um, and again, it, this is a mosaic of ecotonal grasslands, woodlands, and upland riparian shrublands. Um, the other thing I'll say is um, in this area has a really unique um, outcrop of shill communities, which is un unknown elsewhere. Uh, on our system. And so you do have rare plant community, rare plant species, I should say, like the Bell's Twin Pod depicted in the bottom um, right. 
um, which is a species ranked as imperiled or otherwise vulnerable to exportation. Um, and then there's other species like the, the prairie uh, violet, that the little tiny picture in the upper upper right. And so there, there's a lot of really amazing rare plant species and rare plant communities happening here. Leah. Okay, so one thing Heather wanted to point out since she could not be here tonight um, was that this uh, North Foot Foothills HCA supports wildlife habitats um, like riparian shrublands and mountain mahogany shrublands, which I just touched on, that benefit a whole suite of species, including the lazuli bunting. And this is one species that we decided to um, perform a habitat suitability analysis on. And so the map on the, on the right depicts high quality um, suitability and, and, and less habitat suitability. Uh, and we can go into more detail if, if people have interest. But in general, the, this species likes dry, pushy hillsides and other buildings. Next, Leah. Okay, so something more than I can speak to greater is just uh, my, my knowledge of bluestem communities, big, big bluestem, little bluestem communities, grassland communities um, that form the basis of the food chain for a whole suite of rare skipper, if you wanna say butterfly um, species that um, females only lay their eggs on these species and larvae only um, feed on these species. They uh, literally cannot feed elsewhere. So that's, again, we have a habitat suitability analysis um, related to that. One more, Leah. So I, in general, this, this foothills um, habitat conservation area, it, it truly does support a full suite of wildlife habitats and plant habitats um, that further benefit deer, prairie rattlesnakes, golden eagles, so much more. Another one that we wanted to uh, showcase was the lark sparrow here, which again, we did another habitat suitability analysis for. Um, and I think from our natural resource group, um, our feeling is utilizing this uh, Raytheon trail easement will increase habitat buffers of these sensitive natural resources and apparently increase the habitat block size, I, I'm told by something of 50 to 60 acres, which is amazing. Um, and then there's other thoughts from staff that by placing the, the trail further east, you know, down slope, um, will not only maintain that larger habitat block size, but also reduce the temptation of visitors uh, to travel further west into the HCA, potentially without a, a, a trail permit, off trail permit. Um, and so ideally increase the, the chance of compliance of, of staying on trail and out of the HCA. And so that's, that's really important to us. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay, there we go. <laughs> it's a really bad time for my mouse battery to die. Um, so uh, circling back to, uh, thanks Megan for a lot of the, the uh, ecological context of the HCA um, and background. And now we're circling back a little bit to more detail about the actual uh, Raytheon trail easement, the easement proposed for recommendation tonight. Um, OSMP staff have been working on and off for the last several years with Raytheon's representatives who are supportive of the city's trail easement proposal. Um, and while still being negotiated, terms of the purchase and easement agreements will include temporary and ongoing access provisions to allow trail construction activities, as well as continued and ongoing access for maintenance and enforcement, including important emergency access to the trail and for wildland fire needs. OSMP will also be able to relocate and replace portions of the unattractive chain link security fence to a more aesthetic design and setback from the trail corridor. Additionally, the city anticipates having certain land management interests over the easement area, including the rights to perform restoration and weed control and the right to restrict other permanent structures within the easement area. 
Terms of the agreements will also allow staff to perform important due diligence activities, including surveying and environmental assessments to better guide the final easement terms and the proposed trail design and future stewardship. Next slide, please, Leah. The proposed easement acquisition will help fulfill master, several master plan strategies, allowing the city to follow council guidance from the NTSA to construct the North, North Sky Trail, um, reducing undesignated trails in the HCA, managing increased visitation and better preserving about 50 to 60 acres of this important habitat block by removing the trail from a portion of the HCA. Next slide, please. The acquisition also supports at least two charter purposes by obtaining a trail easement for passive recreational uses and obtaining some management interests over the property, which will forever protect and enhance the area. So we have preservation of passive recreation use, uh, where the trail easement will obviously host a, a key segment of the Plan North Sky Trail approved by council in 2016, a trail that will connect OSMP's Foothills Trail to, to the south and Joder Ranch to the north. Um, and then we have preservation of water resource, uh, uh, basically of, of uh, scenic areas or vistas, wildlife habitats, fragile ecosystems, where the trail will allow enhancement of the scenic and vista values of the easement area by permitting relocation of the privacy fence and prohibiting structures from being constructed on the hillside. Also, in addition to potential benefits to the wild, also in addition to potential benefits to the wildlife and ecosystem values that that Megan touched on. Um, through the revised trail alignment. The terms of the trail easement will provide OSMP with the right to perform noxious weed control and habitat restoration within that easement area, further enhancing OSMP's opportunity to conserve and restore natural grassland and riparian habitat adjacent to the HCA. Next slide, please, Leah. So bringing it all together and to recap a lot of what you've heard tonight, as well as what you uh, several of you heard on, a, uh, on your site visits, um, now that you understand a bit more about the proposed easement terms, we've detailed the uh, support for the acquisition provided by the charter and master plan and understand the context and content touched on by Stephen Megan. Um, you can see that you can hopefully see the overall benefits this trail easement acquisition will provide are invaluable. Um, again, to, to recap a few of those, it will provide a, it will, the removal of about 5,000 feet of the North Sky Trail from the HCA with the alignment through the two easements, um, which allows protection of rare plant communities and lessens the spread of invasives in the HCA. Um, these in, it allows uh, choke cherry and other uh, shrubland communities to remain intact, increases setback from other plant uh, important plant communities. Um, it allows flexibility in the trail alignment and the ability to limit trail location on the steeper grades to the west, which allow a more sustainable trail design and less erosion. Um, and it allows the ability to relocate and replace the chain link security fence to something more aesthetically pleasing, which improves the scenic values, the visitor experience and such. Um, and it provides access rights to maintenance and enforcement to the midpoint of the trail. So this is a very long segment of trail um, that we don't uh, currently have um, a very, very uh, good access to. Um, next slide, please. And so uh, wrapping up and detailing what, what some of the next steps are, both with the easement acquisition and then also the NTSA, HCA, and North Skag Trail. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. After this evening, staff will proceed to city council with your board recommendation to request their approval of the trail easement acquisition. Um, OSMP and the city attorney will continue to work with Raytheon's representatives to draft the purchase and easement agreements, which will also be guided by the due diligence work, such as surveys and environmental studies. And Steve will give some input on the others. So with the progress forward with this easement, then uh, related to the North Sky Trail, what this means for staff is that we'll continue now to go back out onto the ground to refine what are, is the conceptual alignment and kind of continue to do detailed work on the ground to actually determine where the trail goes in consideration now of how the Raytheon property fits into that um, alignment of the trail. Once the alignment is um, identified, then we can move forward with permitting processes, which will then lead into construction. And you'll hear a lot more about kind of the next steps with the North Sky Trail um, in a, what we're planning on is a follow-up um, uh, discussion with the board or at least report out to the board next month on the kind of the more detailed steps with the North Sky Trail and the North Foothills 
HCA um, implementation. Um, but I think it is worthwhile recognizing too that staff's um, goal here is with the completion of the North Sky Trail is while we recognize this area to be the HCA, the on-trail requirements have not been yet activated. That has to come through a separate action and ordinance approval through council. And so um, one of those actions, once the we move forward with the uh, alignment and progress for the construction, we will also be moving forward with the processes to activate the HCA upon completion of the North Sky Trail. So those are some of the facts that we'll come back to and give more information next month, but are certainly in the next steps as we progress for the North Sky Trail itself. All right, next slide, please. Thanks, Leah. Um, so uh, to wrap up, we have the staff recommendation in front of you and are opening it up for questions from the board. Thank you so much um, for the presentation and uh, especially thank you for making yourselves available for the site tours. Of course, on a project of this magnitude and scope, it really is helpful for the board to see it. And we really appreciate all the time you put in um, to do that hands-on work. Who has uh, questions for the staff? Karen. I'd like to add to your comments, Hal, and and thank uh, both the Megan and the resources and stewardship staff for years of work uh, to do all the natural resource inventory work that has gotten us this far uh, and, and really painted clearly the value of this really critical wildlife habitat and the unique unfragmented nature of the whole thing. And also to thank uh, Bethany and the real estate staff, as well as the work that, that Dan and Steve have both put into this for years now to try to acquire the easements. I, I think it's a very important uh, concept that has been pursued relentlessly by staff to meet council's direction and to enable us to, to uh, retain more unique unfragged, unfragmented habitat in the system. So thanks to everybody. Thank you, Karen. Um, we, we do have a public hearing, so uh, there'll be time for us to discuss this in more detail as the board. Um, if people don't have any clarifying questions, we can go to public hearing. I am uh, amazed. I, the the uh, presentation was quite great. We had a lot of questions answered on our field trips. If we have no questions, that's remarkable and we'll proceed. Is that what I'm seeing? Wonderful. All right. Um, I guess we will see. Do we have any sign ups uh, for the public hearing portion of this item, Allison? No, no one signed up and I'm not seeing anyone on from the public. Wow, that's remarkable. Well, um, we are moving fast this evening, folks. I will open up the uh, sort of reversion to the board segment um, just to offer a couple of my thoughts on this particular project. Um, speaking more in direct plain English to the public, um, I am incredibly impressed with this uh, easement and the trail alignment it will make possible in terms of where it will put the pinnacle of the North Sky Trail. It's a far more intelligent place than the prior vision. Um, it really preserves a north facing swale, which actually is sort of the densest and wettest of the, the many swales that are out there, um, preventing the trail from climbing into some very awkward territory. It essentially preserves a really um, remarkable promontory. Um, I also uh, found myself very convinced that the details of the easement you negotiated and the way that it will preserve and prevent development within that area is effectively an expansion and extension of the HCA. And to have that be an outcome that is here is remarkable. It won't uh, necessarily be categorized as such, but from all points of effectiveness, from where, the new uh, from where the new fence will go, it will have the net effect of increasing the, the, uh, the con uh, habitat conservation zone, let's call it. Um, I also really think uh, in terms of the mountain bike community, 
that the trail alignment you've made possible with this is the one that's going to have um, the optimal flow and is going to present the most accessible and usable version of the trail for all the kinds of uses that we really wanted to have, which may not always be technical riding. I, I look forward to maybe getting out there to go to Lions to hear some bluegrass music. Um, this really opens that trail up to more people. Um, basically, I find everything about um, the deal that you presented extremely compelling. I would say the only uh, one hesitancy that I saw myself was I'm not convinced that the mixed usage of dog on leash on this trail will ultimately be the right long-term solution for this area. I know that's a more complex discussion, um, but nonetheless, um, certainly where this allows the trail to go looks to me to be absolutely optimal. And I'm just uh, deeply impressed by your ability to, to get us this as a community. Thank you for that feedback, Cal. Does anybody else on the board have some thoughts, ideas they'd like to share? Dave. <laughs> Thanks, Al. We're all having the same problems. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to copy you, Bethany. <laughs> oh my push the button. <laughs> Uh, so let me just start by saying that uh, I I agree with uh, Hal and Karen that uh, the, the staff work on this has been has been really good and reassuring, um, and certainly I appreciate it. And the field trip was uh, very helpful. So thank you for 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 all of that. Uh, having said that, though. I, I, I think this trail is unfortunate. Um, and I know the decision has already been made, but I, I just wanna kind of express several cautionary notes as we move forward um, and two in particular. One is that uh, we are bisecting uh, with a major north-south trail, one of the last remaining intact, relatively unfragmented, habitat blocks uh, on, on the northern front range, quite frankly. And I, I don't think we should lose sight of that in our enthusiasm about how we're accounting for all the resource values and the recreational values because we are introducing uh, far more use and impact in an area that has had relatively little um, uh, that kind of impact over time. The other cautionary note that I want to just reference, and especially for the future, is that I'm very concerned about the whole regional trail, the statewide regional trail movement that's been promoted um, by several governors uh, of late. And I'm just uh, concern that this trail as as uh, those trails approach boulder this trail will be seen as a regional trail connection and i think there's a witch's brew of issues related to that uh, both associated with this trail as well as it connects into joder and heil and you know uh, further north and um, along with that comes, you know, increased use, uh, increased uses, and we're never going to get back uh, some of the values that will be impacted um, by those use levels. So I think the trail easement, uh, both on the Foothills um, Business Park and on Raytheon are good. From my perspective, uh, it's, it's the, the best of a uh, of a not very good situation. Um, and so I just wanted to express uh, the cautionary notes, uh, the, especially the regional trail uh, potential for this, because if that happens, then the, the, whole, uh, the whole value of that area is really compromised and, and diminished. So 
Um, I do thank you for the, the good work that you did. I, I wish that this trail did not cut right straight through the heart of a HCA, um, but it will and it does. And so I think we probably have to make the best of that. And I hope that we can uh, do that uh, far into the future. So thanks for your work um, and hopefully uh, things will be okay. I uh, appreciate your comments on that, Dave. I kind of agree with you on the regional connector being an important element of what will in practice happen. And that's why looking at the various user groups and, and what we are going to uh, really manage the trail effectively under will be important because I, I think you're right about that. Karen, I also saw your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether we can have a discussion about what we can do about that, if anything. And, and one question is what kind of an alignment further east um, is being explored in terms of connecting the regional trail? Um, another sub question is uh, given Hal's statement, is there any way we can ask council to reconsider um, allowing dogs on leash for part of the year and just uh, eliminate dog use on this particular trail because of the regional usage and things that have cropped up since the TSA before we actually build and open the trail. Um, so those are two sub questions, but the, and the bigger question is what what options, mechanisms, steps can we take to address the kinds of concerns that Hal and Dave have both expressed, which I think are very valid? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'd look to hear from staff myself on that. I'll, I'll say um, just very directly, this trail is not a loop. It doesn't meet the typical description of a dog walking trail. I don't think it has the same value to the dog walking community as, as it will to the other user groups. And um, as a result, I, I, I really just actually believe that the best management approach, the most sensible one going forward, will look at that because the, the trail is gonna ride fast and it's gonna ride flowy in certain places. You've really put it in a great place so that people can enjoy the bike ride and it's going to be a conflict and so i i personally think that it is worthy of consideration and care makes a good point that things have changed since this decision was originally made so well and there's also how going to be conflict between the bike riders and the pedestrians i'm i'm, I'm less concerned about that um, because people are somewhat more predictable than dogs in terms of their motions. Yeah, um, but in the system, in the system, what we've seen is bikers shove off pedestrians. We have data on that. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think this could in many ways be a less popular hiking trail. But fundamentally, what this was about is a promise because of what we designed in the West TSA to deliver bike access out the spokes to the areas of permitted biking. And, and for me, that's an important promise that was made by both council and prior boards. Um, and as a result, that's the primary focus on use in this particular case. I may sound like a bit of a old record on this piece in hearing your question, Karen. I think the, the thing to keep in mind is that certainly council has the purview to kind of make choices and, and provide guidance that you know, can change the course of what's in a plan or how we do business. I think the thing that they will give careful consideration to, and the thing that I think we all need to give cons careful consideration to, is the amount of work and thought that went through the entirety of the process that is the North TSA plan that engaged the community at a very in-depth level, looking not just at the North Sky Trail, but across all the access, all the resource considerations, all the types of opportunities throughout all of the North TSA, 
to find those conversations, those discussion points, those common interests, the places where there wasn't agreement and how to find compromise through where there wasn't agreement to land where we came to what was agreed through through the community process, through the careful vetting of the board and through the uh, you know, careful conversation and final guidance that's embedded in it from council. So the risk we have is by choosing to tackle one aspect is that we undercut that kind of built-in collective decision-making that was made across in a kind of that whole balance that came across in what was decided to come up with the recommendations in the plan. Having said that, it's not beyond the purview for us to, once things are implemented, to understand how things function and to come back with information to make adaptive management decisions, which may be a place we're in, but it may be a challenge point to pre preemptively mm -hmm. have those conversations and may do a disservice to the process or create distrust in the outcomes when we engage the community to be thoughtful and invest their time in decision making, only to have a follow up process come and tease it apart. So I will just Steve, lay those uh, yeah. considerations. I think I think you make a great point with that, and I think all my uh, you know co-trustees are aware that there is a lot of nuanced politics. But as as open space board of trustees, we're just thinking more about effective management. And just as assuredly as walking out on this site and seeing that you'd found a far superior alignment for the trail with this easement. It also appears to me that the, the right adaptive management approach would be to put a hold on the multi-use thing and phase that in rather than saying, oh, we'll phase that back um, over time. And so I, I understand the politics that went into the decision. I just think it's unfortunate from a strict land management and recreational management perspective. Um, and I, I don't know if I personally have the will to um, force that battle on this, uh, I feel that speaking about it and talking about it uh, at this stage is enough. Um, and, and I'll say for me, once again, I, I really just raised that as the only weak point that I see. Um, Dave, also, I thought what you had to say about the rare um, plant communities in the shale outcroppings to be really interesting and thinking through if we can even get some enhancement in that through this process, I see as like another opportunity in it. Um, and keeping the, the the resource value really high in that area. In any case, um, I'll open to other folks. Caroline, we haven't heard from you. Is there anybody on the call that can speak to the regional trail status? Casey may be on. Well, and Karen, um, are you talking about uh, which particular regional trail? You know, there's lines or uh, Longmont to Lobo, Boulder to Longmont Lobo. There's Rocky Mountain Greenway, there's- The Rocky to Rocky Trail that's supposed to cut through Boulder and go north. Yeah, so um, I can give you a, we are planning to have a regional trail written update uh, in the next couple of months to you in which we're going to revisit all the regional trails and provide you all with an update. But really uh, as far as, and, and if Casey is on the phone or Mark, uh, all the work so far has been is to almost like with this easement to clarify where we're at coming into Boulder. And so uh, getting past uh, that question of how to cross uh, the highway and getting onto Boulder County and, and uh, Boulder's open space system south of town has really been where the energy has, has been put. There hasn't been uh, much work in working hand in hand with Department of Transportation or Boulder County leading north out of Boulder at this point. It's all, all the work as far as Rocky Mountain Greenway has been towards what happens once you uh, get up to the refuge and uh, and then up, up to the highway. Uh, but we can elaborate that in, in a written uh, memo that Casey's gonna be putting together. Dan, let me just follow up on one piece. Sorry, Mark, let me jump in. Is this issue of the regional trail connection was very much front and center too mm -hmm. when council and in the consideration of the North Sky Trail. And it was pretty clear council was very kind of provide supplemental support just when they were adopting the plan to recognize the intent of the North Sky Trail is not to serve that Rocky Mountain Greenway connection. That's not the connection purpose of the trail and that ideally, and we should do 
it's part of where the open space and mountain parks can leverage that, but all the partners is look, when we're looking at that regional connection is to look elsewhere, look further east to make that connection because of the nature of what we're talking about with the North Sky Trail, the placement in an ACA and the fact that we're minimizing the footprint that may make it less ideal from what the true intent of the Rocky Mountain Greenway connection is. So that's something that's really still clear and, and present within staff thinking of how we engage in conversations with future and other agencies out there for regional connections that really the North Sky is not that connecting point for the Rocky Mountain Greenway. Yeah, and I can I can add um, that in, in conversations of, as Dan said, most of the Rocky Mountain Greenway conversations has been focused on the South. At one point we thought there might be a, a grant working on the North. There were some preliminary conversations um, that, that's no longer right now a focus of our work, but all of our partners were very much aware of that, just what Steve said, that in no way should this be considered part of the regional trail connection. We need to look further east. That was uh, made very clear to all our partners when we even started talking about this. And as I said, that section has been put indefinitely on hold. So um, we're, not, we're not talking about that right now with our partners, but we did relay that message. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah, I just think that we should not be myopic and think that uh, in the future that that won't uh, come up as an issue because once it's there, it's there. And it, it looks like a trail, feels like a trail, must be a trail. Um, and again, I, I, I'm just concerned that every time we look at a new trail location, it, it, it always feels like we're looking in HCA. And uh, that just negates or denigrates the both the importance and talk about intent intentions of those designations. The department always said in the visitor master plan that if there are any trails, they should be on the periphery or, or even hopefully not located, but definitely on the periphery. And this cuts the heart out of uh, the HCA right in North Beach. Dave, I, I, uh, I see your point. One thought that occurred to me on that topic is that many of the, many of the reasons the trails end up being proposed in the HCA are ultimately caused by private inholdings. And I, I really feel what the staff has done here is kind of like the story of how we'll ever accomplish anything in the future, which is figuring out how to get trails where they're actually supposed to go rather than improbable places in reducing incursion to the HCA. So from that standpoint, I almost see this transaction as a model for what we need to see executed more in the future. Does that make sense or is that fair? Can you tell me a little bit more about how you see it's it's promoted by private land holdings? I didn't um, understand the link. Um, so I was referring actually to Eldo Walker and other areas where trails have been proposed, where the trail gets proposed in an improbable place essentially due to the inability to build it where it should be. Um, and that's what this deal is about in particular. Um, <clears throat> it's about putting the trail where it's really supposed to be. And it, and it required a, a working with a private landowner. And so to that extent, I see it as something we'll need to engage more of if we really want to avoid additional HCA incursion in places once a trail is promised like it is in this case. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just, yeah, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you on that. Yeah, Hal, I, I think, yeah, there's, there's a, from my perspective, a, a, a very excellent trail uh, location in, in El Dorado that isn't going to happen just because of that. It's more than one private landowner, but uh, several. Uh, well, well, and I guess that's my, my point is like to the public, they pro some people probably think this project has been too slow, but um, our department staff was actually cooking up a far superior solution that was well worth the time, research and thought, you know? Um, and, and we're gonna have to do more of that basically is all I'm saying. In, in these other locations, if anything will ever be considered realistically. Yeah, and again, I think there's a there's a, a preferable alternative location to to this uh, proposed alignment east of US 36, 
but again, it, it faces a, a number of the, in, in fact, probably an infinitesimal more issues um, than the ones in El Dorado. But th there is an alignment that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, it happens to have the feeder canal uh, on it, but uh, that makes a whole lot of sense for a, a, a more of a regional trail connection than this one. Well, um, for me, I guess, um, and, and Caroline, uh, we didn't hear from you. If you would like the floor for a bit. Yeah, most of what um, I have to say really is kind of an echo of what's already been said. Um, I agree with what um, the majority, if not all of what Dave has said. Um, and, and I do think that the point of slowly implementing multi-use, I think is more beneficial um, than having everything and then trying to pull back. I just see um, the former being less conflictive um, for what the function of the trail is actually going to be. Um, and then again, just being mindful with our ecological system. Um, and, you know, I, I hear a lot in the community about the the vanishing wildlife and it you know it it is something that i really listen to for people that have lived here for you know 10 15 30 years and been able to really see these marked points where um that has gone down so um, i know that we all are mindful of that um but again echoing points um what karen was speaking of regarding the dogs on leash you know, that's a huge um, player in the amount or lack of wildlife. So um, I think that in these types of areas that should really be looked at closely when we make these decisions. Because I think once once they're made and we say yes to these different rec groups, it, that it's harder to pull back. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I guess with that, um, I uh, myself am delighted to move this. When I look at the recommendation itself, I actually think it represents value for the preservation characteristics inherent in the easement alone. Everything about the trail itself aside. Um, and so I can confidently move forward myself. Um, so I move that the Open Space Board of Trustees recommend that the Boulder City Council approve the purchase of a public trail easement, including access rights for open space purposes over property located at 6901 North Foothills Highway from Raytheon Holdings LLC for $23,500 per acre and with the purchase price of the easement not to exceed $235,000 subject to OSMP and city attorney's office review and acceptance of due diligence, uh, due diligence and easement documents. Second. Great, we'll call the roll, Karen. Yes. Dave. Yes. I am sad we don't have Michelle with us tonight. It would have been uh, interesting to hear from her on this topic, um, but that represents a unanimous decision this evening. Um, thank you again, staff, uh, for visualizing this, seeing this, executing this. Um, it's, a, it's a great piece of work that you did out there. So thank you so much. Thank you all for your input. Yeah, thanks, trustees. And I, Hal, uh, that's it with matters or, or public hearing, and we'll turn things over to you for the final segment of tonight. Dan, you mentioned coming back in a month or so what is the next step coming back oh, we, we just wanted to follow up you know tonight was really honing in on the trail easement itself and we wanted to provide a, just a written update um and some of uh, a lot of what we'll probably provide in the written update uh, we provided you out uh, out at the site but we wanted to have it in record and have it available to the public so they understand what the next steps are with the north sky trail what kind of timeline we're on uh, when uh, sort of the next, uh, uh, when they'll start to see some uh, work out on the property. So just to sort of daylight more of the specifics about the trail itself over the next couple of years. Um, it might not be a lot of new news for some of you uh, who, who we've 
uh, field a lot of questions in, but we just felt like we needed to do some public daylighting uh, as far as an official written uh, uh, memo in the packet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, with that, and boy, look, we're right on schedule. Um, we turn to matters from the board, um, and our first subject here is the appointment of an OSBT subcommittee to help prepare for a fall 2021 OSB retreat. Um, I will say, I served on this uh, subcommittee last time. It was Kurt and I. We spent a wonderful hour and a half in a coffee shop together talking open space and what our biggest, uh, most philosophical concerns were and, and uh, you know, sort of polling other board members and putting a nice day's agenda together. Um, I think this could be one of the best subcommittee roles we do. Um, and we're basically looking for two people to consider helping us uh, figure out what we'll do for a retreat. I would like to serve on that, Hal. Awesome, Dave. That's wonderful. <laughs> and I would like to as well, but I, I almost feel that it's better to have a, a more recent appointment. I think that's fair. Work with Dave on it. Is um, I don't know how how um, many meetings you and Kurt have. I, I feel surprised if you guys just met one time. One time it was a, uh, we did talk on the phone and we had a beautiful hour and a half. But really, <laughs> you just get to put a few subjects together and yeah. then let it unfold. You know, in my personal opinion, the board retreat is about being more spacious and less regimented. So in that case, it, it, it's a little more gestalt and, and fun that way. Yeah. I'm, and then, I'm and then there's some policy. coordination with staff. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, certainly. I'm um, happy to serve and help if that is the board's wishes. If someone else, um, you know, has their heart set on it, I'm, I'm happy to step aside as well. So um, whatever anyone would like. Well, I, I, that sounds great if you're willing to do it. That would be lovely. Awesome. So we have Dave and Caroline. You have, um, you have coffee for an hour and a half. <laughs> Set aside. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Me too. So that's great. Um, is there anything else under matters from the board um, people are interested in discussing this evening? Would it be helpful for us to oh, go ahead, Dave? Uh, Hal, I've got a quick one. And Dan, this is for you. I, I found the two information items uh, helpful, but I was a little perplexed with the Dowdy Draw Trailhead reconfiguration for equestrians in that we talked about a redesign, but we never saw what the redesign was. It, it, is there any chance that we can actually see what, you know, is being proposed as the redesign? Steve? Jared? <laughs> yeah, I, I think if the, we're still working on some final pieces and Jared can kind of redirect, but it's certainly something we can provide as part of the email updates we do to the board. Right. So that would yeah, be I think that, that'd be efficient. Helpful. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah, it seems like all the constraints mean that the footprint is not going to change, the layout will change, but um, it's hard to imagine what it might be so it'd be great to actually see what's planned sure we can we can make that work yep great we still an evolution so we didn't want to necessarily give you something that we haven't kind of had a better kind of yeah. thinking through but we wanted to give make sure you was your heads up and the community was heads up of work underway that's going to happen out there thank you you can, you can shift from north sky to dowdy draw <laughs> <laughs> Um, one other thing, uh, Hal, I just, uh, while we got a break, um, I think of, as all of us know, the draft uh, CU South Annexation Agreement uh, has come out and there, there was a meeting uh, this afternoon uh, that Dan and John and uh, Karen and I at least uh, partic or attended. Um, and one of the things that struck me is that I, I was disappointed in the uh, draft annexation agreement language as far as it addressing uh, some of the issues that the board raised in its uh, resolution. 
However, I found it very interesting that uh, Phil Kleisler uh, and, and um, um, God, Dean, no, yep. no Taduchi, Joe, no. no, and Joe referenced, uh, in fact, put up a slide that actually addressed a whole number of the issues that were raised in the uh, resolution. And in fact, uh, you know, I was concerned that about this 155 acre open space assertion and Taduchi said, well, you know, the city's going to buy, you know, the, the open space that's, uh, that's there and bring that whole number up to 155 acres. And so um, if that's really the case, then I think uh, that that is helpful. Yeah, so just to clear Clarify, Dave, the 155 includes the acreage that's needed for the uh, flood mitigation projects. So it's 119 of open space right, and right. 36 acres for the right. flood project, right? And, and how do we square verbally what we heard today with what's in writing in the draft agreement? Because I, I agree with Dave. When I read the draft agreement, I came away with a different idea than what I heard verbally from Joe today. And that's disconcerting to me because clearly the, the legality of the written document is going to prevail. Well, um, so th that's a that's a draft agreement, Karen. And um, I know there there are there is some language there that was probably put in last minute that still needs to be looked at by the attorneys on both sides. But now is a great time for any member of the community, including yourselves, to um, point out anything that you see in that language that may not be um, fully clear or could could use some some adjustment and through the Be Heard Boulder page or um, directly to Phil would, would probably be the best way to do that if you see anything. Um, I, I think also, I think staff is will be working on uh, ways to be able to look at that agreement and, and, and pull out elements. So I suspect we may see a, a, a summary, for instance, of where all the open space elements landed in which you could, we could kind of sort of tick through them rather than piecing them out throughout the agreement as well as a way of comparison to- that, uh, that'd, that'd be great. Someone ha from the public has suggested that a, a table of contents or something like that is included because it's really hard to follow any trend throughout the agreement. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I wasn't I, I wasn't planning to, to do this, but I just want to uh, recognize uh, John's involvement in representing what staff has felt was very important elements and what we heard from the board. And uh, he ended up being on the negotiating team uh, to bring in the open space voice and uh, I uh, think that John's, and I know that John's involvement um, in working with staff at the negotiation level uh, brought us some successes that were looking pretty tenuous um, just a few weeks ago. Um, so um, while you all are looking at the details, you may not see all the language that you wanted in there and the specificity you wanted in there, but some of the big, big elements like water rights and 119, um, a lot of that was due to John's presence. So I just want to thank you, John, for, for that and, and for representing the open space uh, uh, attributes. Um, so just wanted to recognize that. I was unable to attend that meeting. Does anyone know? Um, I'm sure it was recorded if, sure if it's it going to have a playback. It's hard to say where things are going to land. Uh -huh. uh, if you've been to the city's website recently, you get to a lot of no such site, no such page. <laughs> and Caroline, I, I do know that this was the first of two or three meetings that they're going to have uh, talking about the agreement and getting this one was more of a sort of staff working through the major major pieces of the agreement and then being able to answer some uh, uh, chat questions that were raised. The next couple of meetings that are planned are going to be more about hearing back from the community. So this one would be one that would be good to look at if you just sort of want to get a summary of, 
of what's in the agreement. And like I said, I would expect that some sort of summary thing that Karen was saying would be helpful. I, I would think something like that's gonna be forthcoming. And just because I have my calendar in front of me, did, did um, at the end of that meeting, did they schedule the next, not yet? Not, not the next community briefing, uh, but we do know uh, the next formal public hearings is gonna be at the, the planning board uh, would be the next uh, 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 public hearing item. And next Thursday. Yeah. A week from Thursday. Yeah. A week from Thursday. And then council is uh, looking at what their public hearing uh, dates are going to be. Um, one was in September, but they may be switching that a few days. So kind of uh, keep an eye out for uh, landing on some final council dates. Thank you. If I could just jump jump in real quick, uh, John. I guess I I would appreciate your sense of uh, kind of what you heard today, especially that slide that Kleisler and Taducci put up that you know basically out outlined a number of the issues that we had uh, raised in the in the resolution. It, I don't see those really ref reflected in any specificity in the annex annexation language, but it certainly appeared that they were saying, well, you know, the city is in the utilities department is willing to, you know, ad address uh, many, if not all of those concerns. Yeah, I'm not sure which slide that you're referring to, Dave. Do the well, it's, it's kind of toward the end of their, their conversation, but it listed, you know, wildlife habitat and, you know, what water okay. and, and kind of all, it just was kind of a laundry list of what, seven or eight things that basically represented, oh. you know, the general categories that uh, were in the resolution. Yeah, but it was the categories and not the details. Yeah. Oh, so okay. It's, it's like, it's like so sound and light. If we're going with what the code said, says, then yeah. it means we can have a major sport field with amplified sound and lighting and, you know, everything that a big ball field has. <laughs> right. That was the, yeah. the noise and lighting were the two that had the, the most specificity because they just re referenced the city code. Code, but that's right. not. But that, yeah. right. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, You're interesting. Yeah. The, uh, so as, as Dan mentioned, um, they're, they're working on a summary document that uh, we should be able to get out to you uh, hopefully in the next day or so. And that I think that will clarify. It, it's kind of in between that slide that you had, which was really kind of high level and the detail language of the agreement. It's, it's a, a good... Um, Kind of translation of that. I think that will be real helpful. And if if um, when Dan sends that out, if you have any questions, just let us know and we can um, clarify on that. But basically, I mean, I think there is a path forward through this draft agreement, um, subject to that. I know there is some language still in the agreement that probably needs to be clarified, and um, we've got that on our on our radar. Um, also, it would be great to hear from the public on that. Um, but uh, um, that that should be that that should be um, able to be resolved. And basically, I think we have a pathway forward to meet like ninety percent of what the OSBT resolution was looking for, and and just making sure that the language is right to really do that well. Um, I think is just the remaining piece on that. So is the negotiation team team still meeting? Um, I don't think there's any scheduled meetings, but there will be most likely after there starts to be feedback, further feedback from the public. Yeah, I think this this document is going to take a while for everyone to digest. That's clear. Um, yeah. One thing I know uh, for this board, um, I found interest in section thirty six which uh, relates to US Fish and Wildlife and other permitting, I suggest you take a close look at 36. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna be absorbing this for some time. That's a, that's a serious document. <laughs> well, I think we ought to thank again, uh, Dan and John for, for their participation. And, and John, I, I'm attributing the, the success to the fact that you finally let your hair down in the, in the, uh, in the, 
I keep staring at it. I didn't even know that that existed back jam. there. <laughs> Uh, you guys crack, crack me up. <laughs> uh, uh, Caroline, I just want to mention that um, apparently the list of people who were being notified about the CU South city meetings has morphed sometime in the last few weeks because there are many of us who have been participating in these meetings for a long time that were not notified of last week's changes in the delay of the release and things like that. So if you wanna make sure that you're on the distribution list, I would suggest that you send Jean Gatza your name and say, would you please make sure that I am on the distribution list? And her last name in case you don't know her is G-A-T-Z-A. It's G-A-T-Z-A and then a J for Jean. Is that correct, everybody? I think that's right. BoulderColorado.gov. Okay, I'll do that tonight. And I just, uh, uh, the new website that was just released a couple of days ago, uh, on the front page of the public facing website, uh, the CU South project is the first featured project on, and it has links uh, that you could go to the draft agreement and a whole bunch of other information as well. And it also has uh, Jean's contact uh, uh, information as well as Phil's. So uh, the website might be a, a good place to start for basic information. Yeah, I would, I would agree with you, Dan. That page is really great, but getting there is a real problem. You can't get there through Google. If you, if you, try, right. to, if you try to search for CU South annexation. It, it'll take a little bit for all that to flow through to Google. It's gonna be an awkward moment. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, I don't, yeah, I just clicked and went right to it, but I, um, yeah, I, I'm, I didn't use Google to get there. So, yeah. Yeah. I, and I don't know how to deal with my computer. If Leah hadn't told us how to get to this meeting on the website, I would have still been searching. <laughs> so thank you, Leah. Well, Karen, we're very fortunate. Um, we're not going to be searching the next time we see each other on August 4th. We go down to People's Crossing. <laughs> At five o'clock, not yeah. six. And dinner will be served, right? Picnic dinner on the spot. Well, we'll, we'll have to see. Catered. Okay. Catered, yeah. I want, I want veggie burritos. <laughs> Ooh. I'll, I'll eat anything. <laughs> Hey, Dan, one, one other quick thing. Uh, would you like uh, Caroline and I to in, initiate uh, setting up a meeting or would you want to do that on the uh, board retreat? Yeah, so Dave, um, I would, uh, uh, I'll go back and refresh um, how we assisted Hal and Kurt last time. I, I believe you, you all put some uh, inquiries out to get some feedback through email as well. And mm -hmm. of course, in order to sort of do things correctly. I think that would go go through Lee and I. So we'll, we'll, we can be an interface for you to contact with board through email. And then, and then we did have several meetings in which Kurt and Hal met with staff to sort of lay things out. And, and even staff brought up a few issues that we would love to see surface as well. So there was a, once you all sort of landed on some main topics, we did get together as sort of a group of four or five of us and and start to iron out the details and that sort of thing. Okay, so, so we'll, yeah, we're here we'll for that. Await, we'll await further word from you then to begin. Um, sure. Yeah, we we could we could talk about how you want to begin. If you and Leah or Caroline want to begin with just a verbal conversation, like with Kurt and Hal, then come back to me and say, "Here's where here's sort of where we're landing." We could take it from there. Okay. Otherwise, if you want to begin by communicating through email with the trustees to collect ideas. If that's gonna be your first step, then yeah, working with staff would be the first step. So it depends um, on how you wanna go. Yeah, and, and Dave, we have two months. Basically what we're hoping is uh, you and Caroline will report back to us at our September meeting uh, about, what, um, about where staff and you guys kinda of wanna lead us. Great, yep. sounds good. Yep. But yeah, view me as your contact. Okay. Wonderful. Um, thank you again, uh, everybody from staff for joining us. Um, I see one or two members of the public, uh, smaller meeting today. 
Um, but great business and have a lovely evening. We can adjourn this meeting. Thanks. <laughs>